2020. Um, this committee hearing will be conducted as a virtual meeting in accordance with Ohio Open Meetings Law and Section 101.21 of the Codified Ordinances of the City of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976. This meeting is being held using the Zoom platform and may be observed on YouTube and on Channel 20, as well as being live streamed online at TV 20. The committee hearing will be conducted as all committee hearings in accordance with the council rules, rules of order. The chair will facilitate the meeting and call upon persons to speak. If you wish to speak, please use the raise your hand option on Zoom. Please limit your comments to all matters before the today's committee. As is usual, any actions to be voted on during this committee will be done by voice vote, called, recorded by the committee clerk as required by rule 15. Okay, any questions? If not, we're gonna begin the committee hearing. Um, I hope all members of the administration that have been requested are here for the, um, for the uh, meeting. So we're gonna get right into it. <clears throat> find it here this safety committee addendum i got the addendum okay okay so it's committee safety committee okay to my honorable colleagues ordinance number six ordinance number seven six two dash 2021 by council members Griffin and Kelly by departmental request, authorizing the director of public safety to enter into one or more uh, required um, contracts without competitive bidding with Ax Axion Enterprises Incorporated for tasers, accessories, licenses, training, and certification for the division of police department of public safety for a period not to exceed one year with four one-year options to renew exercising, exercisable by the Director of Public Safety. Uh, Madam Clerk, does it have the appropriate signatures? It does, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Director of Public Safety, would you care to comment? Thank you, Chair. Um, that's correct, ordinance number 7762-2021, six, six, if passed by council, would authorize the Director of Public Safety to enter into one more contract with Axon Enterprise Incorporated for tasers and accessories for the Division of Police for a term of one year with four one-year options to renew exercisable by the Director of Public Safety. This legislation will provide the Division of Police with device licenses, replacement of duty cartridges, docking stations, cartridges, and holsters. The Division of Police will also receive training and certification on these devices. The tasers, and accessories will be funded through capital project funds. Okay. Uh, You're on mute, Mr. Chairman. Question to the director. Are all frontline officers equipped with tasers? Tell me, tell us who is equipped with tasers. Chair, uh, Deputy Chief O'Neill is on and she can answer those uh, specifics. Deputy Chief, would you care to comment? Is she there? I do not see her. Her name is on the, is on the uh, screen on the second page. Yeah, but she needs to come on. He needs to come on. I'll, I'll answer that specific question. Okay. Um, Chair, is that our, our officers, our frontline officers, uh, are equipped with the taser units? Okay. Okay. And so I'll front the supervisory uh, uh, individuals have them as well, or just the front line? It's my understanding that this is the front line. Front line? Okay. Okay, let me get this thing up. Okay, any questions of the committee? Committee members? Councilman, Councilman Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman to the safety director, um, why is um, without competitive bidding with Axon, 
Uh, why are we going out without competitive bidding? And do they currently have a contract with the city? Director? Yeah, so that, that is who our, who our current tasers are through. We, have, we do have uh, contracts with the city. I see the DCO real and the uh, police detective staff are all on the screen as well. DCO, do you want to elaborate? Uh, if I might add, echo coming out of your front. Mr. Chairman, the safety director is very difficult to hear. Yeah, we're hearing we're hearing a very we're hearing a, a bad echo. Is that better? Yes, it is. Ah, there you go. All right. Okay. Would you care to comment again, director? So we do have um, we do have contracts with um, Axon for our current tasers. And Mr. Chairman, to the safety director, when was the last time we went out for a competitive bid? Director, that I don't have that in front of me for the for the date. Um, does anyone on the executive staff know the exact date? Did anybody comment on that? I, I apologize. We're, we're having trouble logging on this morning. Um, the last time that police went out to competitive bid is probably about 10 years. We use Taser because we use the Axon cameras and they, they work together along now, with evidence.com. Uh, wait a minute. I, I can't. Who, who is speaking? Who is speaking? Who is speaking? Sorry. This is DC O'Neill. Thank you. We're having you. problems with our, our computer system. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Can you hear us now? No, we're, you're fine. Go ahead. Okay. It's probably been about 10 years since we went out for a competitive bid. We use Taser and Axon body cameras and they work together. And no one else makes a Taser product. Mr. Chairman, to, to DC O'Neill. No other company makes a taser product. Exxon's the only one that makes a taser product. Through the chair to the councilman, the last time we went out for competitive bid, there was one other product, but it actually used um, like a gunpowder in their product. So as of now, we don't know of another product just like taser. Okay. All right, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I would I would be hesitant um, for this to be uh, a one year contract with four one year options to renewal by the safety by the public safety director. Um, I don't know if it's been ten years since we've went out for competitive bid. If a company has arisen in the last ten years that could maybe possibly provide a different product, a better product, or maybe not. But um, for this to be a fi another five-year contract um, without a coming back before the council, 15 years without a competitive bid uh, seems to be a, uh, quite an extensive contract for the city to have with one company. Director, would you care to comment? Yes. Uh, so, Councilman, through the chair, the options to renew do not have this. It's actually that it's an, it's an option. We do not have to renew that contract. Um, we, we are always looking at the industry and assessing uh, where technology is and how that technology may align with the division of police. And if we find something better or, or put something out, out for, for bid, then we do not have to, we would not have to exercise that option. No, I, I understand that Mr. Chairman to the safety director, but I don't know if that motivates you to maybe possibly find um, a better price and or equipment for this for the division of police um if you don't have to come back before the council um maybe after a year or or whatever um just just my opinion mr chairman thank you very much okay thank you it's the chair if i could Who, who's that who's chief williams yes chief awesome. yeah, if i could real quick uh, uh axon uh which makes taser is a uh, almost 20 year company that has a proven track record in electronic control devices. Uh, they've withstood several uh, court challenges for the device itself. And the device overall has been approved, has been proven 
uh, to be not only effective, but to be safe uh, as far as causing serious injury of deaths to individuals. And that's why uh, probably 100% of the agencies out there use uh, the Taser Exxon product. Okay. Uh, to the good, good to know. Thank you. Uh, to the safety right, what's the estimated cost of this? Who's the chair of the councilman? It's the first year is. Um, the first year is $932,160. What is $160. Okay. To the, to the uh, clerk, does that, does that compare to the legislation, the number in the legislation? Can somebody answer from the, from the clerk's office? Does that reflect in the legislation that you have before you that dollar amount? Mr. Chairman, the amount is not in listed in the legislation. Why, why not? Can somebody, can tell me, can somebody tell me why it isn't in the legislation? Well, then one of my colleagues need to make a motion that it be incorporated. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I would recommend that we hold this piece of legislation till the next safety committee hearing. I, I'm not comfortable passing a piece of legislation without the dollar amount attached to it. Okay, there's been a recommendation made. Um, is there? Um, I second. Well, well, wait a minute. Before I before I call upon a second, I'm going to go back to the safety director. Director. Um, is there a reason why that was uh, left out of the piece, out of the legislative piece? Chair, uh, I don't know of a reason. I do know that this is, um, it's not unique to uh, bring legislation um, for these types of, for, for, for items without having the amount in there. Um, the amount is the $932,160. Um, and we also, we always, you know, try to exercise our best ability to, to negotiate that down. Okay. So again, there was a, there's been a motion made, and I and I believe seconded. But I, before I call uh, on the motion, um, is there any? Could who, Chief Williams again? Yes, Chief. Yeah, Mr. Chair, we've uh, been in this process of getting the, uh, the new tasers on board for almost a year now. Uh, our taser supply is kind of getting down to bare bones. We have the older taser models out there. We actually uh, piloted the new T7 that we're trying to get now. We have about 70, I think, out, uh, and they work effectively. They okay. work a lot better than the old ones. And the old ones are getting towards the end of their useful life cycle. They're not making parts anymore. So, you know, the longer we prolong this legislation and get this process done, the longer we're the, the more we're going to put our officers at risk of not actually having a device that works out there. Okay. So that's why we've been trying to push this the last couple months. Okay. Well then let's, let's, I, I will ask the, the, the councilman case who made a motion, uh, councilwoman Santana who seconded, would you re would to my, would, to my two colleagues, would they reconsider and just include the dollar amount in the legislation? Mr. Mr. Chairman, this is a $5 million piece of legislation, if not more. We wouldn't be doing our due justice as the okay. financial overseers to the city if it was that important. And I understand the the, the urgency of this, but um, then there should have been a dollar amount attached to it. You're talking almost a million dollars a year that you know that we don't know about, and we're okay with an open-ended piece of legislation. There needs to be the dollar amount attached to the legislation. Well, uh, that's what I'm asking. Would 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 you both reconsider your motion to hold? And include and, and substitute in the dollar amount so we can move uh, forward. I will not. Okay. We, 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 meet, we meet at least every two weeks. Okay. Councilman Santana? And, yeah, and an opportunity to discuss the dollar amount. Okay. There's been a motion made and seconded to hold a piece of legislation until the next committee hearing. Are we going to open this up for Mr. Chairman? To yes, discussion? yes, we are. Yes, we are. So, Councilman Jones, would you care to comment on the motion? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, certainly I, I understand the, you know, the, the situation. The, the question I would have, Mr. Chairman, um, to um, 
the chief is, uh, can we get more information on this? I know that this is expanded out, uh, how it would have impact. How do we compare this to contracts that we've had in place uh, in years past? And um, the other issue was that I, I presume this was the only vendor that we could contract out to is, is that we couldn't, there was no one else. And then a compare and contrast between the kind of equipment that you're working with now uh, and uh, the kind of equipment you will be working with. Let the chief, the chief would you care to respond? Because there's still a motion pending. Chief. Yeah, Mr. Chair, to the uh, committee, uh, again, uh, Taser, uh, from what we've seen over the last few years, is the only manufacturer, Exxon is the only manufacturer of a, uh, of this conducted electronic uh, electrical weapon device. Uh, it is effective. Uh, again, probably 100% of the agencies out there actually use it now uh, because of that effectiveness, because it has withstood uh, challenges in the court system. Uh, the medical profession has reviewed its effectiveness uh, as far as injuries and death, and it has passed muster. Uh, just a, a couple of numbers I can give you. Uh, right now, we currently have about 1,232 tasers out there for our frontline officers and, and members of the division. Uh, of those, uh, probably about, uh, I'd say about 80% are the older models. Uh, we have a model that's a little older than that. We have about 26 of those. Um, but the tasers that we have out there, again, are at the end of their useful life. They're not making replacement parts for them. Uh, we put out an order uh, this past September that basically states this is all we have. And if a taser breaks, then the officers really aren't getting replacements. Uh, if you remember, Mr. Chair, we also put out an order towards the front part of the summer to actually take tasers back from certain officers in the division that actually aren't frontline officers, that don't use them day in and day out, to make sure our frontline patrol officers had a taser. And we were kind of successful in doing that to stave off not having enough, but now we're at the point where we're not going to have enough uh, if we don't get this contract done before the end of the year and start getting those new tasers in here. Okay. Okay. Appreciate your comments. Councilman Jones. We can't hear you, Councilman. Mr. Chairman, thank you. How, how much is, uh, Mr. Chairman, to the chief, how much are these tasers costing us uh, per taser? And um, if we're, we're allocating a million dollars, and, and this, is this a million dollars over the course of five years or a million dollars, Mr. Chairman, over the course of 10 years? Chief or safety director or whoever would care to comment. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I, I, I could real quick, uh, the, um, the, the total cost of, of the five-year contract is $4,550,160. Uh, I don't have the individual numbers for a taser just to buy one, uh, but it is about $900,000 a year that first year. And then every year after that, it's about $897,000 uh, to maintain those tasers. Uh, we actually have uh, within there, there are spare tasers that we actually get in that contract price, along with training cartridges, along with um, replacement tasers and a warranty if tasers break. So for that five-year period, uh, we don't have to pay anything else other than that contract price. Uh, and currently, I've been made aware that we have uh, two academy classes that don't have tasers that have recently graduated because we don't have enough tasers to put out there currently. That's so we have a class that's in session now that's going to graduate uh, sometime in uh, early March that won't have tasers if this contract isn't finalized here uh, by the end of the year going into 2022. And these tasers, this is this, uh, Director Howard, these tasers are um, a critical uh, tool for public safety as it is a non-lethal option um, when officers need to use um, a, an amount of force on um, a subject that is um, that requires force to be to be used. So it is a, is a critical non-lethal option for the officers to have um, in their duties in patrolling the city. I, director, I don't, I don't believe anyone is questioning the necessity or the effectiveness. Uh, you know, I was here when we implemented the tasers years ago, and it was really a, it was a, 
one of the driving um, requests of council to have tasers so we can um, have more non-lethal uh, confrontations than, than what we were experiencing at the time. We wanted to make sure that not only were officers protected, but the citizens were protected as well. And that's why we advocated the route to, to equip all of our frontline people with tasers. So that's not the issue. The issue has, has been, as we you're hearing in this discussion, is, is the cost of the of the of the of the, the units and then the, um, the over overall five year um, plan, Councilman Jones, you have any additional comments? Yes, Mr. Chairman. You know what's really critical and what would uh, certainly improve um, um, the communications between the council and the administration is when you're putting um, your legislation together to make the request. Um, it's always important, and I've seen this a number of times where. Um, the, what you're asking for, you don't have the money amount included in the actual legislation. Uh, and, and in some instances, you don't have a, uh, a portfolio talking about the, the need for, as the chief has outlined, uh, the shortage that is happening um, in the police department as it relates to the need for the tasers. And, uh, and giving the council a better, clear understanding and education on uh, the type of tasers that you're moving from and going to and, um, and, and what the advantages of it is and what are the market prices of that uh, gives us a better understanding of what you're asking uh, us for. And, um, and that would, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the administration, to the chief, to the safety director would help us tremendously uh, in our deliberations and not hold up any processes to try to get any uh, further information because it hasn't been included. Uh, and then years ago, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, you, you, you realized that under another, another administration, all that stuff was provided. We had the information and um, we just are not getting enough information when you're making requests for $4.5 million for replacing of tasers uh, to kind of have to pull that out of you, um, you know, uh, what the actual cost and try to break it down, it's, it, it wastes time. Uh, it, it would be more important to, to have all this stuff packaged, uh, you know, given to the council. We understand what you're asking for. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I'm not uh, against um, um, uh, this uh, proposition, but how it has been packaged, I understand um, my colleagues asking for um, uh, a wait and see approach on the whole situation. So um, I'm not un unready on this. I realize that we have to make sure that our men and our women are, are fully equipped. But at the same time, um, Mr. Chairman, to uh, the chief, we have to do a better job in communicating to the council uh, what your needs are, why you're asking for it, and why the five years, and why it's not a competitive know uh, uh, why I didn't go out for competitive bid so all of these things mr chairman to the chief would help us uh, on this side of the table to understand what your needs are what your situations are and how we can um, be more informed as a council to assist you to get the equipment and all of the stuff that you need to have uh, to equip your uh, men and women to protect and keep our citizens safe so mr chairman um, if, if the chief and the administration is listening to this hopefully um, as we finish out the year, we'll have a better understanding uh, of future pieces of legislation. Um, and with that, my, my last question, Mr. Chairman, to the chief, my last question to the, to the chief, Mr. Chairman, is um, that how much did it cost us to equip our men and women before with the, the previous models? Uh, and then that would be it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the chief, can you answer that question? Yeah, Mr. Chair, to the uh, councilman, um, yeah, to, to, to answer all the councilman's questions, um, we are prepared to talk extensively about uh, the TASER program and what's needed. Uh, I, I think I put some of that out there already. Uh, we, uh, I did manage to get a per officer cost on a TASER, and that's to equip the officer. That's for the charger, that's for cartridges, that's for training, for everything. It's about $3,450 per officer. So it's a package. You don't just buy the taser. You have to buy the training. You have to buy all that stuff together because there's a certification period that happens every two years for these officers 
to make sure that they're competent in using the taser itself. So all that is a package, uh, what they call a bundle that's sold by the company. Uh, taser is the only manufacturer for law enforcement right now, period. And, and I've stated that already. Uh, we have done our due diligence to get the best price possible for the city of Cleveland for our officers to get the newest generation of tasers. And we do that every contract cycle. Uh, we've saved uh, about $700,000 by actually bundling the packages that I talked about, all the things that officers need to actually operate a taser uh, in that five-year package. So if we do it year by year, then you know a contract every year, then we pay an additional $700,000. By doing this five-year plan, we saved the city $700,000, and there's nothing else that we have to do. If an officer breaks the taser, they get a new one. Uh, if an officer has to be retrained, that training's included. Uh, unlimited cartridges. You know, uh, we had an issue a while ago with not having enough backup cartridges to give out there to our officers, so we had to buy additional cartridges. All that's included in this five-year plan. And again, we have two academy classes, one that's just about to graduate that won't have tasers if we don't get this contract done before the end of the year. So we'll put officers out there basically in jeopardy of having to use either pepper spray and aspartame, which we've probably taken all those back now, or their firearm in defense of themselves and, and what we do out there day in and day out. Uh, the taser is an excellent weapon. It's proven itself to be invaluable in stopping uh, deadly force encounters and lessening those encounters. And again, we're prepared to answer any and every question that council may have on this project. <laughs> but we've been in this process for the last six, eight months trying to get this legislation done, trying to get the packages done, trying to get the best price for the city possible in order for our officers to go into 22 uh, with better equipment. Okay, just th thank you for your uh, explanation, Chief. Councilman Jones, any further comments so we can move on? No, Mr. Chairman, I have no unreadiness. Okay. Uh, there, there, there is still a motion on the floor, but I wanted to say to the, the chief, um, see, the information you just laid out to us um, was important, and we should have had that beforehand um, in, a, um, in a description. Um, I can't stress enough to the administration, and I'm not just not speaking to the division of public of uh, police, but any requirement contract that comes before us, any purchase, the, the dollar amount, and I'm saying this to the clerk's office as well, there should be a demand that the dollar amount be in that piece of legislation. That's to me, that's what how it used to be in the day. Uh, so we knew a dollar amount associated with that. Uh, the other question I want to pose to the chief um, is maintenance of the of these tasers. Is that included in the contract? You said replacement, but is maintenance and repair? To the chair, to the, uh, um, the council and the body, yes. Everything's included in that five-year plan. So the city doesn't have to pay any additional money. Okay. There is, a, a, I, I'm looking, I thought I saw another question by one of my colleagues. Was there, Councilman Santana, do you have a question on, because there's a, still a motion on the floor? No, I, I guess I agree with uh, my colleagues. And I would just say, when can we come back to the table to discuss the amounts, the contract? I mean, and like you said, uh, Mr. Chair, that information that Chief provided, the thirty-four fifty per package, five years, seven hundred thousand dollars that they saved, all that would have been very helpful information to have. So, what's the soonest that we could come back with all this information on the legislation? Chief, when did you provide it to us? Well, again, uh, to the chair, of the uh, committee, um, we've given you the information that we have. Uh, we can come back next week and give you that same information again. Okay. Uh, again, we, I, I thought the process was if we, if council has additional questions, we're prepared to answer those questions. If council wants to see that in writing, then we can answer those questions and then send you that supporting documentation in writing afterwards to back up that. Okay. Okay, um, Chief, and we, we would request that officially, that data you just provided verbally to us. That would be very helpful. Again, I, I, I wanna say this to all divisions and departments. The more information you can supply us, 
the better off we're all going to be. It cuts down on questions. And also it gives us a better perspective as it pertains to that actual piece of legislation that is before us, especially if, if we're purchasing something or buying something. So again, I cannot stress the point enough. So a motion has been made and seconded that the legislation be held uh, for the additional information. Is there any other addition? Is there any comments on the motion at all? At all from many members of the body. Um, I'm referred, I'm going to, for a moment, I'm going to refer to the chairman who just joined us, who was at another um, uh, busy engagement this morning. And that's why I started the meeting. Uh, Mr. Chair, do you have any idea when the next committee would be held? We'll be again in two weeks, as we always do. We'll make sure we have the information. But once again, to everyone, um, you know, we'll, we'll just have a meeting in two weeks. I'll discuss this later with the, with the regular committee. Uh, but we will meet again in two weeks and take this up. Chief, will this help in two weeks? Um, because that still gets us before the end of the year. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, if I could real quick, um, again, I answered, I think, all the questions that council had today. And we can put that in writing and forward that to the committee. Is there anything else, any other questions that the committee has that we can actually forward that information ahead of time? Ms. Tilly will forward that to Chief, uh, I mean, to uh, Safety Director and yourself, and we'll get that information. Any additional questions? I, I, I would just say that I think as much information as you can provide for, to us, then it's always the, the call of the chair that he can relieve the legislation as well. And it can go to the finance uh, committee. But again, I would request respectfully that all the information has be, been requested by my colleagues that that be provided to us. So there's been a motion made, second it. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the point that the legislation be held uh, for want of information. Uh, anyone opposed to that? Okay, legislation is held until we receive that additional information. I, at this time, I will turn the chair uh, back over to Councilman Griffin. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chair uh, Polensic. And my apologies for running late. I had to uh, take care of something uh, very critical this morning. Um, now we're here, ordinance number six, I mean, 767 2021 by Council Members Griffin and Kelly by departmental request authorizing the Director of Public Safety to renew a lease agreement, uh, number 2018 24, with Cuyahoga County for the lease of certain space located on various floors of the Justice Center for a term of one year beginning October 2, 2021. Remarks by the Safety Director, please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Ordinance number 767-2020 if passed by council would authorize the Director of Public Safety to renew the lease agreement with Cuyahoga County. Uh, contract number LS 2018-24 with Cuyahoga County to provide for the lease of certain space located in various floors of the current police division headquarters at 1300 Ontario Street and to amend the contract to change certain terms of the contract. This is the third of, um, of three one-year options to renew the lease. The city would like to exercise a second renewal for the option of the lease. As such, the city and Cuyahoga County have agreed to make changes to the agreement. Again, LS 2018-024 concerning rent of the leased, leased premises. Under this agreement, the rent will increase from $14 to $16 per square foot. The increase will, will be approximately $263,581.50 for the new year of the lease, commencing October 2nd, 2021 and ending October 1st, 2022. All of the terms and conditions in the lease agreement will remain the same. All right, any questions from my colleagues? Yes. Yes, Councilman Palencic, you had a floor. Yes, Mr. Chairman, to the, the safety director. Uh, so there's a $2 per square foot increase, correct? Correct, Councilman, through the chair. And that is for, for how many square foot of the building? Commissioner Droz, I don't have the lease agreement in front of me. I'm sorry. Uh, Commissioner Droz, do you know the square footage? Chair, the council. Yes, yes, sir. The square oh, Hold on, hold on. Who's I can't everybody we, everybody can't talk at the same time. I believe a question was proposed to Jamie DeRosa, Commissioner DeRosa. You had the floor. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, so the current square feet is 131,750 um, or 790 
um, rentable square feet, 0.75 rentable square feet. 131790.75. So the increase from the previous uh, agreement will cost us how much more money, Mr. Chairman, to whoever can answer? Um, Mr. Chairman, so the increase would be $263,000, and 50 cents. 263,581.50. And that would be the increase for this new year, the new term. And and Mr. Chairman, to whoever, how do they justify that um, that dollar amount, that increase? Commissioner, uh, Mr. Chairman, of the councilman. So when uh, Cuyahoga County entered into the lease with the city to continue use of the headquarters, um, they structured the lease that each renewal term would increase by two dollars per square foot. And so this particular renewal term, which is the last one, um, is an increase of $2 up to $16 per square foot. Man, they are hosing us. I mean, our own, our own county is uh, in, included in the lease. What, what is included in the lease? We, we have to maintain our space, correct? Mm. Let's see here. I mean, so, what, what did they justify? That, that, what's the justification? Is there, is it, I mean, what are they doing out of the ordinary that, that we, we are not doing there? Um, Mr. Chairman, the councilman. So it, the, the, the concept is, is the county is encouraging the city to vacate the space um, by increasing it by $2 per square foot. Um, we did um, have a share of utility costs, and I don't have that information. I have it here. I'll have to look for it. Um, but we do maintain our space. They maintain the, the overall structure of, of, of the, you know, this tower of the Justice right. Center. Um, and so we do, um, we did shift the utility costs onto them. Um, the majority of it, but I have to look here to see um, the details of that, that, that uh, the utility costs. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I can understand, you know, utility costs, that's obvious to all of us. Utility mm -hmm. costs have risen, but I don't believe it's risen, you know, to the, the extent $263,000. So, nonetheless, if that is in the agreement and you're telling us it is the 2%, I mean, the, the $2 per square foot increase, that's physically in there? Yes, sir. Man, they, uh, <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were wearing a mask when they did that deal, okay? Let me tell you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilman Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and Mr. De, uh, Mr. DeRosa, the increase for this upcoming year is 263,581. What's the total cost of the contract for the next upcoming year? Uh, Mr. Chairman of the Councilman, so the the total for this one year is 2,108,652 per year. So $2,108,652. And that would be for October 2nd of 2021 to October 1st of 2022. And I remember, Mr. Chairman, when we were doing this contract with the uh, with the county, when we were getting out of, of the Justice Center, and I remember the county, even when we were back in 2018, when we were saying uh, about the increases, how they, they indicated, well, it doesn't necessarily have to increase. Is anybody, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. DeRosa, ask the county not to increase it? Um, Mr. Chairman, the councilman, uh, yes, we have had conversations with the county. Um, no, the county is not agreeable to deviating from what is signed in the lease agreement. Um, we have requested uh, various changes to the um, leasing structure and so far have not been successful with those discussions. They, and they, so they haven't negotiated with us at all? Uh, through the chairman, the councilman, correct. All right, uh, Mr. Chair, the chair, if I may just, just briefly too, and if I'm, oh, if I'm 
Hold on, hold on, bro. One second, one second. Let uh, Councilman Casey finish his point, then I'll come yeah. back to you, Director. Councilman Casey, finish your point, right. and then I'll go to safety, Director. Well, the, the point being is, Mr. Chairman, um, to the safety director or the chief of police, uh, when we negotiated this contract and got out of the, the jail business with the Justice Center because we were building our, our new headquarters, everybody indicated that we may, we, we may have to go to the third year on this, but we may not. So the question is, are we ready to move out of the Justice Center by October of 2000 and October 2nd of 2022 uh, with our new police headquarters? Director. Uh, Councilman through the chair, no, uh, we, we have we have got to get the uh, the new police headquarters accomplished to move out of this out of this facility. Um, it, it's it, and we share your frustration with this. Um, and it, it should be known that if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mr. DeRosa, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, count, uh, county was actually balking at the um, at the restriction of of the limitation on this increase that they were they 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 were considering uh, or there was some cursory discussion of of why just this amount why can't why why can't it be more uh, there is a sense of urgency that we do need to be out of be out of this building and be into our own headquarters well mr chairman to the safety director i think it's more than just a sense of urgency because come october 2nd of 2022 technically we could be homeless right we could be we could be out of the justice center they could lock us out if we don't renew a new lease uh even though in 2018, when we got out of here, or when we got out of this con this the, the Justice Center, the administration was headstrong set on being out by the by October of 2022. How far along are we with the new police headquarters, Mr. Chairman, to the safety director? Commissioner DeRosa can go into, into some detail about that, but we okay. have the um, you know other beyond site work, Commissioner. Um, through the chairman and the councilman, I'm, I'm not part of that team for the police headquarters project. So my, my knowledge of it is limited, but I understand that, um, that the earliest that construction would start would be, I believe 2023, but I, I don't have any details about the schedule of, of how buildings are being sequenced and in, in what portions might be able to be vacated out of the justice center, um, you, you know, the county gives us the authority in our lease to um, reduce our space at any time, not just at the end of a, of a lease term. So at any time, if we reduce the amount of space that uh, we use in the Justice Center, then they would reduce the lease amount um, based upon um, that reduction of space. Um, so there are a couple things that would come into play. Um, I don't think that we're going to vacate the Justice Center completely anytime soon. But as um, portions of the police headquarters project come online, um, public safety would be able to reduce their footprint and therefore reduce the amount of uh, rent that's paid to the county for the Justice Center. All right, Mr. Chairman, just one, one more question then to the chief. Um, Mr. Chairman, to the chief, are we at any point, do you believe in the next year, ready to downsize in the Justice Center? Are we, are we able to do that? Are we able to move any of the um, entities that are in the Justice Center uh, out of the Justice Center somewhere else within the city? Chief? Yeah, through Chair of the Councilman, um, probably not. Uh, there are a couple projects that are uh, going along with the police headquarters. Uh, South High School is one that we were planning on to be able to move some folks around. Uh, also some, some things that our old uh, uh, Public Safety Central in order to move some folks around and, and an adjacent building on Lakeside to move some of our property and evidence stuff out of here to reduce square footage. Uh, but until those projects are basically green lighted and funded to move forward, uh, no, we're not gonna be able to reduce anything in 22. All right, thanks, Chief. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this I know was a special assistant uh, to the Mayor Marty Flask's you know, project. Um, I think we need to keep an eye on this, knowing that uh, we're at the end of our, our third year option for the renewal. And it looks like the county is not going to be working with us at all um, as far as uh, rent payments for this. This is more than $2 million a year we're paying in rent. Uh, and and 
and I don't understand the holdup uh, for the new Justice Center. So, Mr. Chairman, if we could keep an eye on this and possibly in the, in the somewhere in the near future, knowing that we're at the end of a contract in one year from now, uh, with you know more than two million dollars, you know, looming over our heads and just rent, um, I think that you know we as a council and and the city as a whole um, need to start making this a, a, a much higher priority uh, for knowing the financial indications that we're going to have in the near future over this. Thank we'll you, Mr. We need an update, and we will make sure that we stay on top of that in um, the, new just, uh, the new police headquarters and everything, okay? All right, thank you. I got Councilman Joe Jones. Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I just, you know, when I look at this particular issue here that's in front of us, um, again, it's like, you know, um, I would request to have um, the agreement um, that the city has um, put forth with the county. I would also, Mr. Chairman, like to know um, on this particular subject matter and this issue, uh, what are the rates uh, being currently charged? Uh, if we know that, you can tell me now. Uh, in the Justice Center, what are the market rates? And um, the other part of this is what is the, the plan B, um, uh, given the fact that we're we're pretty much, it appears to be a little ways off to building a new center. So I would like to uh, know, Mr. Chairman, what is our plan B uh, as relates to uh, dealing with this issue? And I think uh, my council colleague, uh, Brian Casey, comes up uh, with um, uh, wanting to know uh, where we're going to be at next year. So that is troubling to me that we find ourselves here uh, under these circumstances and um, I would like to know uh, a little bit more uh, about our plan B. And, and can you speak to that, uh, Mr. Chairman, to um, uh, the chief? Commissioner DeRosa, can you give the rates once again? And then number two, okay. director and chief, could you guys talk about if you have any contingency plans? Could everybody please mute yourself? Somebody has got background noise. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DeRosa, you first, and then director and chief. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. So the lease rate is uh, $16 per square foot. And again, it's 131,790.75 um, square feet that we currently use in the Justice Center. Um, that amount of space has been decreased over the term of this lease as we've been able to shift um, uh, folks from the Justice Center into other buildings like Safety Central. Um, but that's the amount that we'll be um, consistent with for the next year. Um, so uh, we also have parking that we uh, that we use in the building. And currently we have 136 parking spaces that's used by CPD. And then just to Councilman Jones point and safety director can chime in and chief can chime in part of the plan B, if you would like to call it plan B um, is actually in our court and our court is South High. That's one of the things that have been discussed. Let's all remember that these are continuation of conversations that we've had over the last couple of years. And there was a proposal put on the table to utilize South High. And um, we're still in deliberations in council that will um, help alleviate some of that, um, uh, mitigate some of that challenge that we have at the Justice Center because then we can start moving our footprint. But I'm going to allow the safety director to chime in and then also the chief. Thank you. Not on you. Chair, um, that you're, you're correct. So South High School, um, you know, our, our initial intent was to have the academy class going into there in December, uh, which would reduce our footprint, the square footage that we would utilize at the Justice Center um, by moving the training academy from the Justice Center to, to South High School. Um, that would be a huge benefit. It would actually give us more space than what we currently have at the Justice Center to use at South High School, which would, which would um, as Commissioner DeRosa said, is that we could reduce our square footage at any time um, and then be a, would be an immediate cost savings towards what we are paying for um, for this contract that we're, that we're discussing. If so, it would be uh, less parking would be utilized. It would be um, less training space being utilized, just less administration, administrative space for those for the trainers would be utilized if the Justice Center shifted to South High School. Um, so not so much a plan B, but as much as, as you have stated, it's a continuation 
um, of the evolution of um, of what what our goal is at, with with public safety with police going into South High School. And I just want to reiterate that these are a continuation of discussions. And to Councilman Casey's point that he made earlier, we will continue to have conversations about the footprint of Public Safety Central, which is on Payne Avenue, the new headquarters, the South High proposal. There is a portfolio of properties that we will have an update and get from Public Safety on how we're trying to move out of the Justice Center and into these other facilities. We have also been working with our consultant um, to have regular conversations and meetings and updates to see the financial impact of all of this portfolio of properties. But remember, these are continuation of conversations, but for today's purposes, today's purposes, let's stay focused on proving this contract in order to make sure that we have a space for these officers at least till next year. And then we will continue to have those discussions about the portfolio of properties. Councilman Jones, anything further? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that you really uh, did a great job in um, uh, putting it in the box that it belongs in. And I have no further questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Hearing no more uh, questions, Ordinance number, ordinance number 767-2021 passes. Now we're here, ordinance number 781-2021 by council members Griffin and Kelly by departmental request, authorizing the director of public safety to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Ohio Attorney General's Ohio Organized Crime Investigations Commission to investigate human trafficking, criminal activity, and authorize participation in an eligible forfeiture sharing for the Division of Police, Department of Public Safety for a term of one year and automatically renewed for from year to year unless terminated by either party. Director? Thank you, Chair. Ordinance number 781-2021, if passed by council, would authorize the Director of Public Safety to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Ohio Organized Crime Investigations Commission to assist with investigating human trafficking criminal activity in Cleveland. This task force was established to investigate organized criminal activity. Human trafficking has been and it continues to be a grave problem in a, on a worldwide scale as well as locally throughout Ohio and in Cleveland. Victims can be any age, race, gender, or nationality. Traffickers use violence, manipulation, or false promises to lure, lure victims into trafficking situations. This legislation would enable the Division of Police to participate in this task force to investigate human trafficking, criminal activity in the city of Cleveland. All right, um, just a couple of things that I want to make sure that we understand. Um, give us the percentage and how does the percentages break down? When you say forfeiture sharing, what percentage does the city get to keep? What percentage does the Ohio Attorney General uh, get to keep as far as forfeiture of assets? Um, how are those assets distributed and what percentages or what formula are you using to determine those uh, division of labor? Thank you, Chair. I'll defer you to the division. Chief? Uh, through the chair of the council, this is DC Patel. Uh, when it comes to the Human Trafficking Task Force, the Ohio Attorney General is the body uh, uh, statewide, which holds the task forces uh, around the state. And I apologize, um, Deputy Chief. If I know that we are COVID conscious, but um, it's kind of hard to hear you through your mask. It's kind of muffled. Uh, my apologies. Uh, the Attorney General is the entity which hosts the um, trafficking task force efforts statewide. They have task forces broken out throughout the state. In our region, Cuyahoga County is the uh, quarterback, the chair for it, let's say. And we would be one of 14 agencies locally which are participating on that. Normally, uh, when we talk about cost sharing with them, it is normally a 20-80 split. 20 the Attorney General and 80% comes to the local agencies. All agencies don't participate in every uh, investigation, let's say. It might be, for example, the sheriff, the Cleveland police, the Cleveland Heights police, the CMHA. So that will be the split on any uh, cost sharing of any seizures, forfeitures, et cetera. Probably the biggest benefit is that this legislation allows us to not only receive that, 
but uh, received compensation for our task force officer, along with the uh, vehicle, uh, computer, cell phone, et cetera, which they provide and any um, investigative technical, technical equipment, which we would need to uh, investigate not only uh, human trafficking, which is sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Okay. Um, the other question that I have is about renewals. Um, so I need to better understand that these renewals are year to year, but what is the length of the entire contract and why wouldn't you have to come be back before council? The MOU, which the attorney general put together for the entire state, which they had the local uh, representatives, which is here is the Cuyahoga County Sheriff, uh, put out to the locals, does not have an end date on it, sir. It is just merely, uh, you can end it if you're dissatisfied with, with participation, you have a staffing issue or there's other reasons, you can inform them that you're ending it, but it doesn't have an actual end date. The uh, yearly is just, a, just a, a reference point. It is not an actual end date. So how would this council be kept apprised if it's an automatic renewal? We would re report on the uh, their findings, probably have council hearings, uh, primarily with the uh, Sex Trafficking Child Abuse Unit. We report their efforts. A byproduct of their efforts would be human trafficking report. Okay, so I'm going to ask Ann Tilly to put a pin in that, and I'm going to want to make sure that as part of when you guys report and make sure that you report out about your sex crimes and trafficking unit, that we do um, get an update on if we're going to continue in this or not, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, thank you. I have, uh, go ahead, the director, you have the floor. If I may, just to talk about, um, just recently, um, um, it's been, it's, it's, it's posted um, uh, in, in, in the media that there's been a, you know, there was a, a, a successful human trafficking sting that just resulted in, in numerous arrests. One of the art, one of the headlines reads that um, there was a, you know, a, a, a local attorney was among 161 people arrested in a local uh, human trafficking sting. Um, these stings focus on on everything involved in human trafficking, even even the Johns who are who are um, you know seeking um, sex uh, for money. Um, so this sting is very successful, and, and just wanted to highlight that there was a a recent operation that that did result in arrest and a um, human trafficking sting. Yeah, I actually seen that, and I was actually uh, shocked and appalled, um, and um, happy that that sting really netted the way that it did. And we know sex trafficking is very important and um, a thing that we really have to make sure we have law enforcement cooperation around all areas. Uh, I'm going to now go to Councilman Joe Jones, uh, who has uh, his hand up, and then Councilman Mike Palenci. Councilman Joe Jones. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I will yield to the distinguished colleague who is the vice chairman of the committee, and I'll uh, be asked to come after him. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councilman. I appreciate it. We 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 starting to come to a good understanding, Councilman. You uh you getting to understand my style a little bit. Go ahead, Councilman Pelosi. You had the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Th thank you to the to could never uh, can comment. Do we have any statistics? or data broken down on a, on a district level um, and then even uh, broken down more as it pertains to where is the greatest problem taking place in the city of Cleveland at this time as it pertains to human trafficking. Chief for DC Patel. My, my, my apologies, sir. Please repeat the question for me. My question is, um, do you have any data or statistics broken down by district, census tract, um, zip code as to where the, the greatest problem is in the city of Cleveland with regard to human trafficking? Where, where is the epicenter taking place? Through the, through the chair of the council. Currently, as we're just joining the task force, we don't have that uh, data. I know that there is some uh, preliminary data that the task force has collected, but it's not necessarily Cleveland specific, but it does give some indications. Don't have that here. I can certainly provide that later, but there is some indication. We don't have a chart. I'm going to start tracking that now, obviously going forward for a future report. Okay. It's, um, to the command staff, um, to my honorable colleagues, I, I think it's very important that we get a, as much data. Uh, information is power. Um, so we can understand, you know, we're all very much aware of the severity of the problem. We're seeing it not only locally, but we're seeing it nationally. We know there's been a, there's a connection. 
the human trafficking and major events that will take place in the city or sporting events that will take place in the city, believe it or not. But the fact of the matter is, I think whatever information you can supply us that then we can disseminate into our neighborhoods, to our residents, uh, to make them aware of the situation. If we're having a problem, if there's a, a, very, a, a given area, a given street, a given section where we're having this problem so we can ask our residents to be the eyes and ears to, to help us in this process. Uh, I mean, to even be talking about human trafficking in 2021 is like, it's absolutely outrageous that, that we are, all of us um, have to contend with this, with the, this, this vile, um, disgusting uh, behavior and, and, and illegal activity that is taking place in our community. And we've got to identify the individuals involved in this and prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. I mean, I just, we know that it's a correlation as we've been told between um, um, individuals who have disappeared and human trafficking. Um, and it's, Again, for all of us, I, I'm just looking for as much data information as I can get. So again, so we can educate ourselves and then educate our citizenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the command staff. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Just to reiterate what Councilman, go ahead. Um, just just before you go there, to reiterate what the councilman is saying, these hearings will go so much more easy if you guys have data, dollar yeah. amounts as much information as possible. This safety committee is, you know, we're in an age of accountability and transparency. And I know that some things seem perfunctory that we just need to move some things along, but I don't like to see tasers being held up and our guys being vulnerable. I don't like not having to be able to just address human trafficking. These should be things that we just have. So I just want to reiterate, you know, just like council is getting used to each other, you guys know what questions that's going to be asked by each council member when they come to the table. So, Director, if you can please make sure that we follow up and have that, um, but I'll give you the floor, sir. Thank you. So, just uh, through, through the chair of the council, I want to mention one thing. Uh, obviously, it's a national problem, and there are some national efforts. Uh, locally, they, they're kind of distilled. There's been a, a few initiatives which they're holding back on because there's not a capacity on behalf of uh, the human trafficking task forces state and nationwide to handle the volume. There are such initiatives as putting signs in bathrooms, as informing people at the drive throughs what to look for, kind of like we did with terrorism 15 years ago. Same thing with human trafficking today, labor trafficking today, but the system doesn't have the capacity for that. So we're building up to that, and that's why we're at ideal time for us to jump on a task force. But uh, it doesn't go without notice that uh, we need some additional documentation, and we'll definitely collect that and, and present that. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Councilman. I have Councilman Jones. Did you uh, have a point? No, I, I don't have a point, Mr. Chairman. I have questions. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Please move forward, Councilman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, to the Chief, um, how many people are on the task force right now currently, police officers, sir? Chief D.C.? Through the chair to the councilman, there are 13 agencies uh, in Cuyahoga County which participate in the uh, human trafficking task force. How many Cleveland police officers, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the chief are assigned to our task force here in the city of Cleveland to deal with sex crimes? Our participation would be one task force officer because it's a matter, it's a force multiplier. By having one task force officer, we just push the button. We have all the other agencies and their resources available to us or we can reach out to the Attorney General, uh, the Ohio State Patrol Intelligence Unit, or the other task forces in the state. So they don't require that we dedicate a number of officers. They ask for one, which is the uh, the touch point and the force multiplier. And, and Mr. Chairman, how many um, police officers that are assigned to dealing with um, uh, these? I know that we have our own internal uh, force that deals with um, uh, uh, sex related crimes. How many police officers are assigned to that? Through the chair to the council, we currently have 22 investigators assigned to the sex crimes child abuse unit. And, and I and, want to mention also, Mr. Councilman, there's not uh, every one of these is not a sexual offense. Some of these are just organized crime because of labor trafficking or other connections. They are not all <clears throat> number one sexual offenses or taking place here. Many of these organized crime investigations stem from other lo other locales, but there's funding and there's resources that do take place in our region. 
I see. And 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 Mr. Chairman, um, looking at um, this here, how how um, uh, bad is it, uh, or what is the situation? I won't say bad, but let me just say, what is the situation here in the city of Cleveland? Uh, as elected officials, uh, 17 members representing 17 various communities. Uh, is there um, a situation, Mr. Chairman, um, to the chief where, um, it, you know, you could, you know, point out a section that we should be concerned with? Uh, in our city where it, it may be happening more in some areas uh, than others? Or how do we begin to uh, be partners with you um, to be able to understand uh, what we need to be looking for as elected officials and what we need to be uh, looking out for and, and listening for? To the chair, to the council, uh, that's the thing about human trafficking, it's like domestic violence. It, it, it's present uh, pretty much everywhere. Not that it's in, in full force everywhere, but it does occur or can occur anywhere. And the thing for us to be would be awareness. And there's indicators that we'd like to certainly have uh, some fires and push this out to council, push it out to some council meetings. But I think that there's a uh, lack of understanding by the community because they don't see it every day that it is occurring. It does take place. So their partnerships certainly with the Center uh, for Missing and Exploited Children, uh, missing persons, et cetera because there is a great deal of people who are not only alienated, who people feel are uh, targets for trafficking, but there are also people who could live next door to you, uh, go to work, go to school, and all of a sudden they find themselves in a traffic situation due to association. And normally those are uh, situations where they are removed from the area. Uh, Cleveland is not Atlanta, it is not Detroit, it is not, um, uh, New, uh, New Orleans or Sacramento, I believe. I'm sorry, um, San Diego, where it's extremely um, uh, more common, let's say, but there are significant issues here. Toledo, Ohio was number three two years ago for human trafficking in the country because of its close nexus to uh, uh, Canada and also obviously transportation hub in the area. How, how many, uh, Mr. Chairman, to the chief, how many incidents have we had here in the city of Cleveland in the last annual year? Within the last year, rather, through the chair, through the council, we don't have I don't have that number in front of me because we don't track those specifically by those. I'd have to drill down into those and see kind of which incidents may have a related crime, uh, and that's something else we're working on is to identify so we can just push a button and have that number come up out of our system. And, and, and then, lastly, Mr. Chairman, and I close. Um, it, it would be good, you know, when we're when we're talking about these situations. I remember that. Um, the director uh, um, had uh, given us information on um, stats and statistics when he was asking for uh, a renewal of a grant and it was showing the production of what that meant. So as we're going into this agreement uh, with the various different agencies uh, to deal with this issue, um, it would be uh, good to know what is and how effective and, and efficient uh, this agreement uh, has been in the past and will be in the future uh, being able to understand what the productions and productivity was uh, of such agreement. So is, is that a possibility, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we can, this committee can get that information from Once again, we'll put that in, embed that in when we get updates for the sex crime and sex trafficking units that we have with uh, the city of Cleveland and uh, we'll embed that in that report, okay? Uh, Mr. Cheers. Chairman, no further questions. All right, thank you so much. Uh, uh, hearing no more questions, ordinance number 781-2021 has passed this committee. I will now move to, we had an addendum and uh, I wanna make sure I move to this addendum. This is, uh, you received this uh, addendum. It's ordinance number 866-2021 by council members Griffin and Kelly by departmental request, authorizing the director of public safety to apply for and accept a grant from the United States Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, for the FY21 Port Security Program and authorizing the purchase of by one or more contracts of one police boat and associated equipment for the Division of Police Department of Public Safety. The estimated cost is $156,000 $398. Director. Thank you, Chair. Um, ordinance number 866-2021, authorizing the Director of Public Safety to apply for and accept a grant 
from the United States uh, Department of Homeland Security, FEMA for fiscal year 21 port security grant program and authorizing the purchase of uh, to buy one or more contracts of one police boat and associated equipment for the Division of Police Department of Public Safety. Um, on for us to, uh, to address this more specifically is uh, Don Hartsong, who oversees our grant program. Thank you, Ms. Hartsong. Yes, uh, hello everybody. Um, this was a grant that we applied for a couple of months ago. We were advised that we have been awarded the grant. Um, FEMA is going to provide the city of Cleveland $469,194. There is a local match of $156,398 for a total program cost of $625,592. And this funding is all going to purchase a new police, uh, a new police boat. Um, there's 2,500 just in travel and training to uh, to go pick up the boat. But other, other than that, it's basically all to purchase a new police boat. Great, thank you so much. And uh, how many? uh officers will this boat like hold and you know do we have a will this be a maritime unit that will be staffed or you know making sure that we have the bodies to staff it so do we have a maritime unit that will be staffing this and how will it operate etc to the chair to the councilman um and, and to the committee we have a, a public safety marine patrol team it is a call-up team made up of volunteers much like the bob squad uh, we have a uh, currently we have nine members assigned to it, and we're going to add some additional members. The key thing is those members will need some some training, which is uh, boat crew operator training. Uh, this boat uh, will have capability to carry six members, uh, comfortably assigned, because it's just something that you have to have a bare minimum of four. You think about it: there's an operator, then there's two other members. If someone falls in, you're going to need two guys to pull the other guy back in. Now, with six, it would obviously give us greater capability for obviously search and rescue, and we can even conduct dive operations off this boat if needed. Thank you so much. Um, and just out of curiosity, how far out does our jurisdiction go out into the waters before they become international waters? And how far is our jurisdiction and when do we turn it over to the Coast Guard? Because I've actually had the good fortune of being out and, you know, you, you don't always see all the boats that are kind of floating out in the middle of Lake Erie from the docks. So how far out does our jurisdiction go? Uh, to the chair, to the committee, to the councilman, uh, the uh, international border is 24 miles away. It's the middle of the lake. Our local jurisdiction uh, extends three miles out from the shoreline. And that's like for... Um, uh, say misdemeanor crimes, we had to cite someone. But outside of that, our officers are deputized so that they can have jurisdiction all the way to the border as we are part of the Northern Border Initiative, which we uh, did partner with the state and the Coast Guard, Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Metro Parks, et cetera, uh, to kind of have a common front. It is the only program of its kind in the country. It was funded initially by Operation Stone Guard from DHS, and that allowed us to get our training and equipment, et cetera, initially. Thank you so much, Deputy Chief. I think we often forget that we are a border city and we border and, um, you know, uh, on the other side of this great lake that we have is another uh, country. And um, we also, you know, have a lot of maritime activities that happen that need this kind of patrol. So kudos, I think this is a very good investment and a very good thing that we should do. I have Vice Chair Mike Polinsic and then Councilman Joe Jones. Councilman thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman, my honorable colleagues and to the command staff command staff. Um, just educate me. We had the, the Delaney, which was decommissioned. And it was my understanding that there was, and I'm trying to jog my brain here. Uh, I thought we had passed legislation some time ago to acquire another police boat. Can you bring me up to speed? Yes. Through the chair, to the councilman, in 2009 or 2010, we purchased a 27-foot Boston Whaler, uh, right. which was the uh, foundation for the Public Safety Marine Patrol team. Uh, the intention there was to have an integrated team participate in the Northern Border Initiative, and we had the uh, Sheriff's Department join us in that in in endeavor. So we purchased that. That was not grant funded. That was for city funds. It cost $289,000. Um, it was a state-of-the-art at the time, 
And we used that to conduct the Northern Border Initiative missions, which there was, uh, at that point, there was federal reimbursement. We patrol out to the border. And for anyone who uh, questions that, that's kind of a, a rough ride. It makes for a long day to go out there, kind of beat, beat you up. So the guys uh, did a terrific job, uh, participated with all, all of our federal partners and state partners in a variety of initiatives. And then we also conducted uh, local patrols, not only shoreline patrols, but also on the river, also for the various special events, presidential visits where they had to secure under bridges, et cetera. So we had a lot of mileage out of that 27-foot uh, Boston Whaler we purchased in 2009. For okay, so Mr. Chairman, where is the Boston Whaler to the command staff? To the chair, to the councilman, uh, it's currently in for repairs. Uh, the motors uh, were obviously uh, just lifetime out. We had a lot of mileage out of them. And after the course of, uh, it's not, you're not just going out with, with your family. This is patrol work, which they could be out 12, right. 14 miles and get a call from the Coast Guard right. with response base. So those motors do take quite the beating. They were terrific uh, resource for us, but uh, in for repair right now and has not been out this season uh, due to a need for engine repair and replacement. Okay. So again, I'm just, I'm trying to pin this down. So the Boston Whaler, which is the Cadillac, of, of boats or, or mid-sized boats, um, you're going to make the necessary repairs and that boat will be operational again, correct? Yes, uh, to the chair, to the councilman, the Boston Whaler should be operational by next season uh, once we uh, get the boat uh, engines repaired. It is okay. something that we collaborate with Ohio DNR, Metro Parks and the Sheriff to provide a uh, service on the river and on the lakefront okay. during the season. The season normally is uh, June through end of September uh, because there's a, a lot of activity there and obviously there's a need for it. This year we were unable to participate. Last year we split it up and I think we had uh, Thursdays and Saturdays were our day to so, provide the uh, patrol on, on the water. So, so then this, this um, grant will give us a second boat that will be, in, correct? To the chair of the council, correct. It is a uh, larger platform, a more capable platform. Yes, sir. Okay. And this boat will be stored and docked where? To the chair of the councilman. Currently, uh, they probably will both be docked at uh, Whiskey Island Marina. At Whiskey Island Marina. Okay. So you will, Mr. through the chair, you will keep us apprised of this um, when this new boat comes on board and when the... Um, the, uh, the previous boat, because again, I, I, I can't stress enough about communications. See, this is the first I'm hearing that the, that the Boston Whaler, um, and what, what do you call it? There's a name for it. What's the name of the boat? She doesn't have a, to the chair of the council, she doesn't have a name, sir. We didn't okay. name her, just uh, Marine Patrol okay. 1. The okay. SS Balenci. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay. So, um, yeah, just so it's the, not the, the, just so it's not the SS Polensic Titanic or something, okay? Um, so the, the fact of the matter is, this is the first I've heard that that boat is not operational. So, I mean, I can't stress again, I, I just assumed, as I'm sure every one of my colleagues, that, that we, had a, we had a police boat out there somewhere. Now we find out that we haven't because it how long has it not been operational? Deputy Chief. Uh, through the chair for the councilman, I just want to mention one thing. We had uh, significant coverage on the lakefront, even if, with our absence, because of the strong partnerships we have with the maritime community, with uh, Metro Parks, ODNR, the Sheriff's Department, and the Coast Guard. So our shoreline and our river has been protected. They stretched out this year because they knew the how much of an impact we had last year this year obviously we were out of play but we'll keep that in mind and make that part of our regular okay so, but, but deputy chief hold up hold up councilman to councilman Polisic's point deputy chief do we know how long this boat was down and how can we director and chief and deputy chief make sure that we get regular updates when these kind of things happen because these are important for a councilman who actually has a lot of shoreway that believes that these types of boats are in place. Can you answer that question, please? The chair of the council, the boat has been down the entire season. So she's been down since uh, probably end of May. And there was a issue with ordering parts, et cetera. But we can report uh, two things. One, at the beginning and the ending of the season, 
at any other time council requests. But certainly at the beginning of the ending of the season, we can report the status uh, of our uh, maritime capability. And the other thing we can do it is when we have council reports for budget, et cetera, we can make that a one of the items we report on. Okay, well, again, as the chairman just indicated, you know, the, the find out that we haven't had, I've got a two miles of shoreline, to find out that we don't have a police boat operating. Um, and besides, be, before you have to go out, Chief Patel and patrol in a canoe along the lakefront, I would I would assume that you're going to get the, the police boat back up and you're, there, there's going to be some communication to council as to when that's going to come online, back online, and then also when the new boat will come online. So again, communication, communication, communication. We've talked about it. I think there were blue in the face around here. Council has a right. We have a right to ask questions and we have a right to be uh, updated as it pertains to critical services. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Palencic. Councilman Joe Jones, you have the floor and then we'll move on to the final section, which I know everybody's really anticipating, the ARPA dollars. So Councilman Joe Jones. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, and I would like to also talk about uh, if also, Mr. Chairman, uh, do we are we going to have a miscellaneous after ARPA dollars discussion? Uh, I um, it depends on how long ARPA dollars go, um, and um, I will and, entertain that and, after we um, have a discussion about ARPA dollars because that's a pretty intensive document that we're actually going to go through. And once again, um, Councilman, I'm willing to consider that after um, we have that discussion. And, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to, to just put it on your radar screen, I'm concerned about a report that came out um, uh, yesterday from Ed Gallick talking about our EMS response times. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly want to put that at the table. I don't know if uh, the, the uh, safety director and uh, the chief and, and, and the commissioners are prepared to talk about that. But Mr. Chairman, I certainly would like to have some discussions on that particular subject matter, if that's possible today. But I would uh, like to do, what I would like to do if we could, Councilman, is in the ARPA dollars conversation, I believe some of the challenges that we're experiencing with EMS will probably be um, touched on with the investments that we're being proposed to through the ARPA dollars conversation. So if, if we can allow the councilman's points to be touched in that discussion, I would appreciate it to the administration. Does that work for you, councilman? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, right. For starters, I'd like to just, you know, since I've been sitting here on this council now for the last three and a half years, um, you know, I just think that our city is uh, blessed to have uh, Mrs. Elizabeth Hartsong, uh, who has done an outstanding job uh, for our city and, and, and going after uh, these various different grants and being able to haul them in and pull it in. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the work that she has done for us um, and to, to be able to put this grant together and have uh, just the city to make $151,000 match to this and to come out with a bigger, better platform, a boat that has the kind of equipment uh, that can handle the, the rough waters of Lake Erie. Um, I'm really appreciative, appreciative as a citizen that we have that asset here. And I'm appreciative to the work that she continues to do for us in the city. And most of what was talked about, um, the honorable colleague who's the Dean of City Council, Mike Polinsic, um, pretty much uh, went over a lot of the questions that um, I wanted to ask and we had a little fun with it. And um, I hope that uh, uh, that a boat is named after Mike Polinsic. <laughs> that wouldn't be bad. So, but with that being said, Mr. Chairman, I don't have any further questions concerning this other than the, uh, kudos for the department on being able to um, secure these funds and to be able to uh, add an asset uh, to assist the citizens of the city of Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilman. And I agree, uh, you know, Don Hartsong is a rock star, somebody in our administration that um, a lot of people don't know, but she brings a lot of dollars into public safety. I had the good fortune of working with her for many years and um, she does bring a lot of grants in. I, I never thought I would get used to calling her Ms. Hartsong, but I'm so used to it now. I forget her former last name. Um, I just So I guess uh, she is a rock star. Thank you, Don, appreciate it. I'm gonna to go to uh, now ordinance number 
843 and 843-2021 and, uh, by council members Griffin, Brancatelli and Kelly by departmental request authorizing the appropriation of funds from the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 and authorizing various contracts to be executed no later than December 31, 2024 and funds be expended by December 31, 2026. The estimated cost is $121 million, $900, and $315,000. So $121,900,315. million, 900,000, and 315. And we, before we hear remarks from the safety director, I just wanna make sure that I lay out what we're trying to do, okay? We discussed this a, few, a couple of weeks ago with our working groups, and we now have a working group that is meeting every Monday. However, we also said that all of these recommendations and these proposals that have been proposed by the administration will be vetted in each of the committees. Today, you will receive a line item for each of the departments, which is police, fire, EMS, and animal control, line item request for um, of what we're deliberating for ARPA dollars. Now, I wanna make sure that I state this so everybody's clear, even if, and when or how we pass this out of this committee, it will still have to be deliberated with council as a whole through our working group if there's key points that we need to discuss and eventually finance committee. So I wanna make it clear that today is not the final bite at the apple that we have regarding these funds, but it's the first time that we will have an opportunity to look line by line and department by department on what is being requested of ARPA dollars. So I want everybody to understand our process. Once again, council has set ourselves a goal of trying to make a determination on what we believe should be these expenditures by November the 1st. That's why we are now gonna hear from safety director Howard from the administration's proposal based on what we've given them as council, based on what the public has given them, based on what their department heads have uh, made recommendations to do. And now it's time for us to deliberate as a council and make sure that we push this to the next level so that we can fine tune our ARPA dollar um, expenditures for this year. So with that being said, I hope I was clear. Director Howard, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, uh, members of And council. I apologize, did everybody get the document? Because I think you sent it to everybody. I want to make sure everybody got the document. Okay. Did Chairman, it, when, when, when was it sent out? It was sent out yesterday. Director, did you, didn't we send it out yesterday or? I sent it yesterday. I believe finance sent it, sent it as well to- To um, everybody, right? Everyone, yes. So and it sent, sent out. Morning. Um, Mr. Chair. Say that again, uh, uh, Councilwoman. Uh, I received an email by Ann Tilly at 9 18. Okay. So I know Ann sent it out, but there was also something sent out yesterday. Um, okay. But, um, you know, once again, we're now in deliberation. It was sent out. The uh, line item part was sent out. And um, once again, we're going to give the director an opportunity to go through it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, members of the Safety Committee and other members of Council for this discussion. This is really a really important discussion. The Department of Public Safety and its divisions, police, fire, EMS, animal care and control have been a priority of the administration. And our uniform members, uh, men and women, work very hard you know, day to day to meet the needs of our citizens. So uh, this is a, a, a valuable discussion. And um, they're carrying out the demands uh, requires a constant evaluation of our equipment, vehicles, and technology. The evaluation that has been ordered by the administration is consistent with the advice and the voice of the public, being that public safety is a priority. I want to thank the public and the administration for the overwhelming support to the Department of Public Safety. The mayor instructed us, um, the department and each division, to make an assessment of our needs. 
That assessment resulted in a total of over $26 million in equipment, vehicles, tech, and technology requests. During this hearing, the public will be made aware of these details surrounding the request of each division and how the fulfillment of this request will place the division in a strong and sound position for the future. Uh, to uh, uh, contribute to the discussion with me today are the, um, from the Division of Police is um, Chief Calvin Williams and his executive staff, from the Division of Fire, Chief Angelo Cavillo and his staff, from the Division of EMS, Commissioner Nicole Carlton, and from Division of Animal Care and Control, uh, Manager Corey, uh, Animal Care and Control Manager Corey Keller. So if we can start with um, the Division of Police request. This is a request um, that lists um, vehicles and equipment that are needed to, to, to um, fortify and uplift the Division of Police. I'll go to uh, Chief Williams um, and his team to run through the items on that, on that list. Mr. Chair of the committee, um, the division has a list uh, of approximately a dozen and a half items. <clears throat> the uh, bottom line number for our request is a total of $10,239,574. And uh, I can go through every item or I can kind of give you the ranges. And if you have specific questions, we can go to that item. Uh, but it starts with vehicles. Uh, number one on that list is a new uh, SWAT rescue vehicle. Uh, our current vehicle is uh, plus 20 years old. Uh, it constantly breaks down. Uh, it's a vehicle that was specially made for the division of, for the SWAT unit. Uh, actually, when I was a SWAT team uh, officer uh, over 20 years ago, and it served the city well. Uh, it's just not uh, uh, viable for replacement parts and to keep running. Uh, so we need a, a new SWAT rescue vehicle. Uh, of course, uh, we have a number of frontline vehicles, both SUVs and sedans for our detectives, SUVs for our frontline officers, uh, transport vehicles uh, for our officers for large scale events, uh, be it social unrest or specialty events, uh, so as to lessen the number of individual police vehicles needed for an assignment. Uh, motorcycles, uh, we actually have the boat engines on this list that we talked about in earlier legislation about the new boat. Uh, that Councilman Palenzi brought up. Uh, we actually want to get two brand new bolt engines uh, at a cost of about $134,000 uh, so that basically the city would have two brand new bolts uh, here in the next year and a half to two years. Um, protective uh, equipment for our field force officers, uh, additional uh, bike equipment for our bike officers, and then the, the list kind of ends with uh, some ancillary equipment like computers and tablets and things like that for our officers, along with a couple of canines. So I'll leave it at that if you have specific questions about a specific item. Uh, but just know uh, we've vetted this list for a long time uh, with the director and with uh, command staff and officers here in the division. And we feel this is, these are the things that are needed to basically equip the division for the next few years and to keep us in a position to where we don't need um, a lot of the things that are on this list to be replenished over the next couple of years, uh, because we're requesting quantities that would put the division uh, in, a better, uh, in a better position to make sure that we can uh, provide service out there for the citizens of the city. So um, before I go to my colleagues for a couple of questions, how did we determine if a lot of these were eligible? And I, I immediately what comes to mind are some of the uh, SWAT gear and some of those uh, kind of uh, things that I see as equipment um, for event response. How did we determine that those were eligible expenses and why did we need to replenish that as much as we did? So the yeah, determination... But I was gonna say, so the determination of, of what was what would be eligible and what was not um, was evaluated by our finance department, who was familiar with the requirements of, of the funds, what qualified under the funds and what was applicable to um, each of the divisions with regard to what, what was what was requested. So that was um, vetted through our department of finance and through discussions with with um, the safety divisions. Well, I know that we, I've always been a little leery about personnel, and I know that we had to focus a lot on equipment, and maybe I'm missing something, but I thought we were looking at 
a little bit more heavy on cameras and um, other type of gun sensor technology and those kind of tools because I see a lot of, of expenditures. I, I love the helicopter upgrade and retrofitting and those kind of things, but I see a lot of equipment basically being built up for civil unrest. Um, was that one of the eligibility requirements that kind of led us to really uh, making such a huge investment in civil unrest equipment, like protective equipment and helmets and those kind of things? Chair, so this this um, you, there's there's a separate section if you turn to IT. Um, okay. okay, we'll talk about that with regard to cameras. Okay, well, then we'll hold um, that for IT. We'll Thank you. Personnel, we'll uh -huh. personnel did not fall under um, under the um, qualifications for these funds, so you won't see personnel. So that'll be a conversation uh, with finance and with us out of, with, out of um, the the, the uh, city's budget. Um, but this is not it's not. Uh, a focus of, of civil unrest. It's 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 just an, an, an uplift of the equipment that the division of police needs for the myriad of situations, foreseeable and unforeseeable, that that would arise. All right. I just want to put in a request, and this is something that we'll deliberate. Once again, this is our preliminary discussion on this, and this is going to get kicked to a couple of other conversations. But I do, I mean, in light of this, some of your statistics will show that domestic violence and rape and human trafficking and those kind of things have elevated. So um, I don't see a lot of investment in those kind of things. Um, and do those things qualify under the ARPA request? And, you know, I know that we had a horrible May 30th, 2020, um, but I, I think that there has been more everyday domestic issues that I think I'm looking at investing in and uh, just trying to figure out why we didn't invest in some of those things, which we know communities have been disproportionately impacted by a rise in, um, you know, violent crime, rapes and domestic violence and those kind of things. And Chair, that's a lot of what, 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 you're, what you're discussing. That's really um, a matter of personnel to address, personnel to gain intelligence, personnel to investigate personnel to engage with the community to slow or stem those types of violence because the, the you know in, in um, the when we get to cameras we'll talk about we'll talk about cameras but the equipment here is allowed is allow these officers to respond to these dangerous situations the domestic call-ups that involve SWAT situations we've seen a, a, a numerous um, calls up for those throughout the year um, that would require the equipment that much of the equipment that you see on this list I would defer to the division if they want to add anything to that. But again, a lot of the, the, the crime that we see, the biggest asset that we have in combating that crime is, um, is, is people. Did anybody from the division want to answer on what kind of tools? And, you know, I, I just see this as an opportunity for us to be very innovative. And I know that there's a lot of tools out there to deal with some of this human trafficking, as DC Patel just mentioned, and other things. Um, that I don't see listed on here is, has there been any kind of thought that have went into how we could, you know, make investments in those kind of tools? Yeah, through the chairman, uh, through the committee, um, as the director stated, the personnel side is going to be a, uh, um, <clears throat> a discussion uh, during budget talks in the general fund. Uh, we have requested additional personnel, uh, for example, for our real-time crime center, uh, we've requested additional personnel uh, at the district level for additional crime analyst assistance so that each <laughs> district commander has that capability and it doesn't have to come directly from our crime analyst uh, unit downtown. Uh, it's in collaboration with that unit. Um, if you look at the bottom, and I'll let DC Patel expand on some of this, uh, we requested phones and computers uh, for all our officers and detectives out there uh, to assist in those investigations. Uh, along with, the, as you see at the bottom, uh, digital forensics laptops, two of those, uh, to look at uh, emails, to look at uh, the digitally um, investigate cell phone records and things like that. Um, uh, all the video that comes in, uh, as you'll see in the IT part, the additional cameras, uh, that video has to be analyzed in our system. So those two laptop computers will assist our investigators in the field. Uh, and at the investigative level and looking at those type of things. But as the director said, uh, those personnel asked, uh, I think most of those were a little restrictive for this particular uh, funding source. 
uh, but we have requested those additional uh, folks in the general fund budget. And, 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 and Chief, I would totally agree with you on personnel because I've always been leery about if we add personnel and then 2024 comes and we can and we don't have the funding source to maintain that personnel. I've always been critical and concerned about that. So I agree with you totally on that. But I'll just throw this out there, rape kits or those kind of things that are we in just plentiful supply of those things or could these dollars have been used for those kind of things that would have been helpful? Um, you know, that's that those are things that I'm trying to get at, but I won't belabor that point, but that's what I'm talking about with that. I, I do want to throw a couple of other things out there before I go to my colleagues, so I don't take too much of the time. Um, so just so that a couple of my colleagues understand exactly what uh, we're trying to, uh, um, just so I can understand the uh, equipment needs that we're uh, trying to get, get a hold of, you, you had a record in gun confiscation. So um, what kind of things or tools are we investing in to really try to do more with um, helping you guys with gun confiscation? I don't know the technical tools out there. I'll leave that to you, Chief and Deputy Chief Crotel, but you know, we have an increase in car chases and accidents that have taken place uh, throughout the region. We know that drones, um, in order to do wellness and, and, and safety checks and other things to really survey neighborhoods if that have been disproportionately impacted. So I'm just trying to understand why didn't we look at some of those innovative tools that could have helped us with um, some of the increases that we're seeing as far as car chases, speeding, um, you know, surveilling areas that have been disproportionately impacted. Why didn't we look at some of those tools? Just, just out of curiosity. Uh, through the chair, through the committee, you mentioned a couple of things there, sir. Uh, number one is as far as uh, vehicles, uh, you see there's a couple of requests here for frontline sedans, and obviously we know what frontline vehicles are, but uh, some of our plainclothes officers, and I want to give everything away, but our plainclothes officers do a significant amount of work, and they need vehicles that allow them to blend in, which, again, to your point about the pursuits and all those things, that cuts those down. Now we can engage an individual, let's say, at a red light, when they're boxed in and the vehicle stopped without having to go into a pursuit. So that puts us in a definite uh, better position to effect an arrest, maybe uh, confiscate some weapons without having to get into a pursuit. So we did, we did address that. Uh, the point on here about tablets, computers, et cetera, for officers and phones, every investigator should have the capability to access all of our network, not only camera network, but all of our digital resources on their, whatever uh, they have, tablet or phone or whatever. So that is something that we ask for also, not only for just the investigators, but for tr certain patrol officers. Number one is the video that they have allows us to uh, look at certain areas, specified areas, and we have asked for other cameras that are coming, um, which are deployable in certain, in certain situations, which they will have access to on their, on their platform. So that's one thing. The other thing is the digital forensic laptops. We have some programs in the Real-Time Crime Center. We have Command Central Aware, Command Central Analytics, uh, these programs require a lot more bandwidth, and, and that's a loose term, but a, a higher end video card. We're going beyond gaming because you're talking about the integration of various data, uh, of various uh, video, which is very high, and then what we're doing to, uh, um, to exploit that video and then put it in a format that's going to help that investigator on the ground. So that is something we did lean forward on, particularly for the Real Time Crime Center which is one of the areas we uh, um, sought some additional staffing in. All that plays into with the helicopter uh, moving map system. The system is, that they have now is probably 18 years old, outdated, doesn't work properly. Uh, the new system allows them to be focused exactly on whatever they're looking at. And notice, sir, I don't use the word targeting, it's focusing because it could be a call for service that there's a medical emergency. It comes over CAD, but they can respond to it and lay eyes on a situation right away. So that's something that we look for. Okay. Well, there may be some follow-ups, uh, Director and, Ch and uh, Chief and uh, DC. There may be some follow-ups about really trying to, that I have some curiosity about, um, but I won't belabor the point today. But um, last but not least, um, we know that crime is not a bunch of dope boys hanging out on the corner anymore like it used to be. Most of it is done through real-time crime centers, technology, and other things like that. And it also helps with wellness checks and things of our community to really make sure that if we see communities in distress, 
um, that we have the appropriate responses. So I see a lot of heavy um, equipment for basically, you know, um, civil unrest. And even though I know that um, we did have a horrible civil unrest incident with uh, May 30th, I don't think our communities have, um, I think that there's other investments that our community have really need, have a need for than just civil unrest. But um, once again, I respect the fact that you guys did your due diligence. I just um, may have some follow-up questions, but I'll defer to my uh, colleague, uh, the vice chair, Mike Polensic. And then I have uh, Councilman Charles Slife after Mike Polensic. Councilman Polensic. Th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, my honorable colleagues, and to the administration. Uh, you raised some, Mr. Chairman, you raised some very valid points and interesting points. Uh, as I'm looking at the list for the Division of Police, I just want to get some clarification here, if I can. Um, so we're, we're, you indicated, Chief, that um, the rescue, the uh, SWAT rescue vehicle, is this the vehicle that looks somewhat like an armored car or um, is, is that correct? Mr. Chair, the councilman, yes, this is the, the current SWAT team's rescue vehicle. And you're telling us that the existing one is um, ineffective or out, out worn out or what's yeah, Chair of the Councilman, uh, it's past its useful life. Uh, it's constantly uh, down for repairs, and we have to borrow uh, the Sheriff's Department or ask them to bring their vehicle out. Uh, okay. and, and it performs that dual function of not only keeping our officers safe, uh, but also allowing the officers to get closer to that situation yes. to contain it better uh, and be protected. And so an existing vehicle cannot be repaired, or is it going to be, be repaired? No, it, it's in a constant state of being down for repairs. So it okay. goes down, they try to fix it, they get it back up, it goes down again. So it's at the point now where those parts aren't made anymore. So okay. we're going to get to the point where they can't repair it anymore. Okay. And so it is plus 20 years old. Okay. So we're looking at frontline SUVs. We're looking at frontline sedans. And you're looking at 50, 50 detective cars. Mr. Chair, the councilman, that's correct. Uh, our detectives, um, it's kind of sad to say, but usually our detectives are the last to get vehicles because our frontline officers come first. And usually that number uh, is between 45 and 50 frontline vehicles, and we usually get 10 or 20 detective vehicles. So okay. we really want to catch our detectives up so they can actually uh, get out and, and further investigate crimes, our DV detectives, our sex crimes detectives, our general detectives. So we need to up that fleet to get them into the position so that over the next couple of years, they'll be in good shape um, with the okay. number of vehicles assigned to those units. So, though, but those are not, um, those are not uh, police equipped, correct? They're just regular vehicles. And the chair of the councilman, they are uh, equipped with police radios, lights, and sirens, but okay. they're inside the vehicle. Um, they're not undercover vehicles. They're straight detective vehicles, yeah. frontline okay. detectives. Well, uh, all I'm saying is I'm I, I don't I'd like to know where you're you're getting those for twenty one thousand dollars a piece, uh, Chevy Malibus because uh, that's an incredible if that's the, the price that's been quoted you got an incredible price there okay um, so let me move. well it is state term contract and that's the pricing that we get through motor vehicle okay. okay so let's let's move down um, I'm just trying to understand some of these things the um, the clandestine laboratory response vehicle you have under amount uh, zero and then you have sixty eight thousand dollars then again total cost zero explain that one to me yeah through the chair of the councilman that item was removed from our request uh, we okay. can do that through uh, different uh, some other uh, vehicles that we have within the division so we remove that okay so that's gone okay so that needs to be reflected um, then the what's a four person gator? Uh, those are the uh, special event vehicles. You've probably seen them out there already. Uh, we use them in crowd management incidents. We actually use them in a lot of special events for the draft. Okay. You saw them transporting personnel and equipment around uh, during May 30th uh, and after May 30th, I should say, even during May 30th. Our community response unit actually put four man teams out in gators that we borrowed from the fire department, uh, from the RNC gators that we bought. And they transport equipment, personnel, 
We actually had them follow when we have a protest, uh, a, a march. They follow that to provide right. support. So and, it's so it's like an ATV. Yes. OK. OK. I'm just yeah, trying to understand. Right. OK. So then we've got the boat engines, uh, the helicopter upgrade. Are, has the maintenance contract been re, been re, uh, re, uh, reinstated for the helicopters? Mm -hmm. The chair and the councilman, we're still working on that. Uh, and that's the reason for this upgrade. Uh, this basically sends the helicopters out of state and it completely refurbishes both helicopters to light view condition. Uh, you know, again, our helicopters are, you know, getting up on that 20 year, over 20 years old. Uh, they're great helicopters, but they require a lot of upkeep. Uh, this upgrade, again, brings both helicopters back to light view conditions for another 20 years. Okay. Are any helicopters flying now? The chair and councilman, yes. Okay. We have one unit flying? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, let me go back down this list. Okay. Um, protective equipment. Um, ride helmets, et cetera. Um, the tasers, again, zero and then $718 and then zero again. Explain that one to us. Again, Chair the Councilman, that item was removed. That's in the separate legislation that we put all the tasers in. Okay. Um, and then the digital uh, forensic laptops, that's for, okay. Et cetera, et cetera. So, and I'm trying to understand this, the, the big picture here. So this total is um, for the division, the, the, for just the division of police is 10,239,574, correct? Uh, that's correct. We, we think that's a small price to pay to get the division to where it needs to be for the next two, two and a half, probably three years. Okay. As far as vehicles and equipment. Okay. So then the, and we'll talk about cameras at some point. Um, and so where I just want to, because I've been a long time advocate, as you're aware, for dash cams in cars. Um and we've and I've been told that there are no dash cams in frontline units at this point. Is that correct? So Chair Councilman, that's correct. We've had a couple pilot programs because there are several platforms out there. Um, yeah. and, and we've done our due diligence with those. It's just um, right now we're trying to probably made our systems together a lot better from our body worn cameras to our actual tasers to the dash cams. So okay. we're trying to come up with a solution. Uh, there are a couple solutions that marry all three of those together. Okay. Uh, the lights go on, the body cam comes on, as well as the dash cam. Uh, you draw your taser, your body one camera, and if you're within a certain proximity of the vehicle, the dash cam also comes on. So we're yep. still vetting through those products to come up with what's best, the most yep. cost efficient to move towards that platform. Do we know what it would cost to equip frontline vehicles with dash cams? Uh, through the chair of the councilman, we, we have a couple ex estimates out there going. Uh, we can get you what the estimates are, uh, but it is several million dollars once you, yeah. um, uh, again, go to the platform that we want that actually integrates all three of those systems together. Okay. Because I, I personally believe, again, because we hear these complaints of people being stopped with they, they feel were, was unwarranted stops um, or selective stops or targeted stops and dash cams, in my opinion, would level that playing field right out of the gate, would put an end, hopefully, to any allegations that people are being stopped for not the right reasons. So again, I'm gonna to continue to advocate for dash cams here, Mr. Chairman, and to my honorable colleagues. Um, the, um, it's clear to me, if you see the, the, the fleet that we have uh, within the division of police, we need to replace a lot of the cars. But I also, and I'm not gonna belabor the point right now, but I'm, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna give the administration fair warning um, that during the budgetary process, the whole issue of maintenance, maintenance has become, Mr. Chairman, a major concern of mine. We can buy new equipment, we can 
bring on the, the state of the art um, uh, supplies and again, in, in, um, in vehicles and everything. But if we don't maintain things, and when I look at some of the vehicles and some of it, whether it be police, fire, EMS, when I look at the conditions, I keep asking myself, we got to do a better job of maintaining things. Um, we all see how costly this material is to purchase. Um, it speaks for itself, but we, so we have to maintain things in a much better, just like we have to maintain our own cars, our own homes at, 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 for, our, for ourselves, but much better job of maintenance. So Mr. Chairman, I'm going to stop on the division of police. I, I have my questions answered. I obviously, obviously have questions for fire and EMS as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Councilman Mike Polensic. We're actually going to go through each section, so appreciate that. I have uh, Councilman Charles Slife, and then uh, Chair, Charles can I make a comment briefly in response sure, to? Sure, you can. Go ahead, Count, go ahead, Director. Councilman Polensic brought up a good point about the wear and tear and the maintenance of our vehicles, and a lot of this um, really addresses the fact that, and you'll see this across the other divisions as well, is that the uh, what the strain that COVID has put on our emergency response vehicles. I mean, we had to move officers to individual car plans for a while because we didn't know we weren't familiar with, with, with COVID. So our vehicles were getting extreme wear and tear. Our, our, um, when we get to EMS, you'll, you'll, we'll talk about vehicles there, but um, with our EMS personnel responding to calls related to COVID and, and, and folks um, panicking because of what was unknown about COVID at the time. Um, so COVID, COVID um, uh, played a significant role in safeties um, you know, extreme operations, wear and tear of, of, of the vehicles um, and cycling those through persons and, and, and answering calls. So a lot of this really addresses the damage and the, and the wear and tear of our fleet of our, um, you know, I say fleet, I'm talking about safety wide um, that COVID has, has um, placed on our vehicles. And then with regard to maintenance, is that a, that's something that I've been, we've all been concerned about as well and that a significant amount of maintenance is done to maintain the operability of the vehicles more than the aesthetics, uh, making sure that the engines, um, the exhaust system, and the things that, that, that contribute to the operation of the vehicle. Um, but it is something that is on our radar as well. I just wanted to address that. Thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. And on that point, before I go to, uh, uh, to Councilman Slight, does this also help us? Because I, um, I know that in the consent decree that there was a lot of, um, requests about making sure we upgraded our car plan. So does this help contribute to um, upgrading our car plan as um, outlined in the consent decree to help us move closer towards our goal? Yes, uh, Chair. It, so it, this again addresses the needs of our fleet and updating our fleet, which allows us to um, you know, Better, better provide for our car plan. Now we do meet our car plan. We have, we, we provided that at one of the um, um, safety committee hearings that we had when we were discussing all of the divisions. Um, there is a, a significant car plan out there. That what, what, what's, what's really the, 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 the need with the car plan is again is, is, is personnel and recruitment and having bodies to facilitate that that um, that car plan. Okay, thank you. Councilman Charles Slide, you had the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just for clarification, I, I know I'm not a member of, of safety. Uh, is, is this for informational purposes today? I'm assuming there's no like moving this out of safety committee, this legislation at this time. Is that correct? As I as I outlined earlier, we are if we do move it out of safety committee, depending on this, because it is a piece of legislation and right. it has been introduced as legislation in safety committee. Even if it does get moved out of safety committee, we still want to vet it through the working group process, as well as uh, it would have to go through final passage through our deliberation process through finance. So this okay. is the uh, first bite at the apple, as I said earlier, but we will have at least two or three more bites at the apple to address any of these issues. Okay, Th thank you for the clarification. Just wanted to make sure I, I was good on procedure. And then I can, I can hold my questions if this isn't the appropriate spot but you know i i have in front of me the summary that antilly sent over and it's broken down by each of the divisions but then there's a separate page for safety it is is if i have questions about security cameras and the real-time crime center is that best handled now when we're talking about the division of police or are we going to talk about it separately we have a section that's going to focus on it separately okay then i can hold for now thank you okay thank you councilman slight seeing no more questions 
Seeing no more questions, we'll now move to the Division of Fire. Director. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, I'll defer to um, Chief Cavill to run through the list of the Division of Fire. It's a, it has an, a, a total of $3,647, uh, I'm sorry, $3,647,630. Chief Cavill, could you run through the items for fire, please? Yes, sir. Thank you, Director Howard. Uh, good morning, council members. This is Fire Chief Angela Cavillo. I once again, thank you for allowing us to uh, discuss these uh, requested items for the Division of Fire. Uh, the first uh, uh, request is a station alerting system uh, to replace our existing fire station system. And that's a paging system and dispatch system so that we can respond to uh, first responder, medical emergencies, emergencies, and working structure fires. Uh, especially with the COVID, uh, you know, the increase uh, of COVID uh, in the past year, year and a half, uh, those, that falls under our first responders. So it's very critical that we uh, respond with our fire apparatuses in a timely fashion uh, for those emergencies. So that's the first item. And I've got my command staff team to drill into that more if there's any questions on that. The next item is uh, fire headquarters, headquarters office rehab. Uh, we need to get the uh, fire headquarters office rehab, especially with now social distancing and making sure that uh, we have proper ventilation and it's functioning properly. We identified that need in the headquarters of the Cleveland Division of Fire, uh, especially workstations. Uh, the next item below that is the exhaust systems, replacing them all fire stations. Uh, once again, it's outdated, it needs to re replace. And not only are we a fire station, but we also are a community for our citizens that uh, come to our fire stations. So we need that uh, replaced. Uh, in regards to ballistic vests, uh, self-contained breathing apparatuses, our uh, uh, cylinders, uh, SCBAs. These are all equipments that we use uh, in our daily operations in the Cleveland Division of Fire. Uh, we need these, uh, these tools and resources in order to do our jobs. Uh, once again, it's a rotation as far as when we get on the scene, uh, this equipment can get soiled or damaged, so we need replacement. So we've identified the vest, the self-contained breathing apparatus cylinders, uh, the G, G1, which is a self-contained breathing apparatus, the RIP pack, which is a rescue uh, RIP pack that four members actually will stand by in case a firefighter goes down, uh, the breathing air supply equipment below so that we have fresh air so that in a timely fashion, we can go ahead and uh, fill up those uh, air bottles and have air stations so that we can do our job. Once again, all tied in with COVID. Why? Because we respond to Working structure fires, hazmat, and we have to have proper PPE to do our job, save lives, and protect the citizens of the city of Cleveland. Uh, the uh, Fire Prevention Bureau records digital scanning system. We're requesting that. Why? Because uh, once again, we're, we're a business where people come in to get the scans of, of these permits and information in the Fire Prevention Bureau. Uh, by having uh, digital scanning, it uh, actually gets that to the digital platform where we can do a lot of this stuff. Uh, via IT. Uh, the Surface Pro computers, Toughbook uh, uh, computers, once again, that's for our inspectors to get them out more as opposed to in our headquarters. So we had that social distancing so that they can do their jobs, perform the permits, inspections, and also our first responders so that they can perform their uh, basic life support treatment. Uh, and then that, that's tied right in with EMS so that uh, that information in regards to the patient's information, uh, what we're dealing with, uh, possible COVID or what have you, uh, that can be uh, captured through this digital platform. Uh, once again, tied in with COVID. Uh, rescue mannequins, uh, uh, once again, it's, it's, it's first responders, it's first responder care, and all that ties in with medical emergencies. The interactive remote learning system. Uh, once again, this is a tool that we're going to use for our training, not all of it, because obviously we have to do a lot of hands on training. Uh, but my chief uh, director, uh, Chief Schomer at the FTA, uh, will actually have the system in place so that we can do some of that training throughout the fire station so that those members can stay within their battalions, within their wards, so that we, we, they can get the training there at the stations and uh, also uh, respond to medical emergencies, first responders, working structure fires, and still be effective and efficient within the division of fire. 
uh, cordless rescue tools. Once again, these are tools that are needed uh, in uh, motor vehicle accidents, uh, extrications, uh, entrapments. Uh, you name it, we do it. But once again, we need these tools in order to operate. And if they get soiled with, uh, you know, uh, any type of contaminants, uh, once again, we can turn around that in a quick fashion to get our members back in service so that we can provide safety to the people. Uh, I've got my, uh, my great command staff team here present today. I've got uh, Chief Nada, uh, Chief of Operations, uh, Chief uh, Anthony Luke, uh, my Chief of Staff, uh, Chief Greg Lightcap, uh, Information Services, Chief James Stum, uh, he's in charge of health and safety, uh, Chief Thomas Schlomer, uh, the Director of Training, uh, and Mrs. Deidre Lisman, who makes it all work with procurement and funding. Uh, I believe, uh, did I miss anybody else? Is anybody else in, I think I, I captured everybody from my uh, division. So we are open to questions. Thank you very much. Chief, first of all, you know, thank you for the presentation. And I must also want to commend you guys once again for the ISO designation. I, I don't think that nearly got as near as much attention and, and um, account, you know, um, as it should have gotten because that is a huge designation. So I'd like to thank you and your team for doing that. I also want to thank Slomer. I know the former chair of safety, Matt Zone, really had a dream to really help make sure that we had our public safety uh, training center where we could actually train our firefighters up here. And um, that's happening now too. So I wanna commend you guys. I think all of these things help complement, um, not only help us recover from COVID, but help complement um, your vision and goals for the fire department. So thank you so much, Chief. Uh, I'm gonna move to my vice chair, Councilman uh, Mike Polensic, and then I have Councilman uh, Brian Casey. Councilman Polensic, you had the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, Mr. Chairman, um, to the Chief and to the Command Staff of Fire. Um, Again, obviously, you know better than we do uh, as it pertains to the personal gear and personal apparatus that is um, required for the firefighters to maintain their safety when they're on the job and responding. My question is, I noticed that there are no recommendations in your uh, selection or submission to us as it pertains to the vehicles themselves, yet um, I've seen reports where it shows a good number of the vehicles in poor condition. Do you, can you respond to that? I'm talking frontline fire apparatus. I'm sorry, I think Director Howard has a comment. There you go. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Uh, Councilman through the chair. Um, vehicles um, for, for the Division of Fire were not qualifying um, items um, for this for this funding, the vehicles will be addressed out of the city's budget um, and and be discussed at an appropriate time um, when we discuss that. But the um, the need for vehicles for the division of fire is it is not being ignored. It just did not qualify for um, underneath the um, the ARPA funds. Okay, well th that's that's important because I want to make sure um, that our frontline um, response vehicles. Uh, those that need to be replaced are replaced. So I'm going to be looking um, along with my colleagues to when that will be um, submitted to us or when we can discuss that specific point. Um, let me look at something else here. The, um, the, um, the very first item, I'm assuming that's location, station alerting system. Uh, that, that's actually a vendor, uh, but what we'll have to do is put it out to bid. It, it's a station alerting system, but that's one of the vendors that can actually do that system. So but, is that supposed to be location? Or no, it's, it, it's, it's correct. It's locution. Okay. 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 Gotcha. Okay. Now let me see what else I had here. And then as it pertains to the, the rehab of the fire headquarters, uh, this is just to bring it up to present day standards? Yes, and I'll defer to uh, my command staff team, starting off with Chief Luke in regards to uh, uh, what we're requesting and why we're requesting this. Chief Luke, please. Good afternoon, Council Chairman. Yeah. Um, the line item for the fire headquarters uh, rehab is specific to the Fire Prevention Bureau. Uh, the Fire Prevention Bureau offices are the public interface of the Division of Fire and the public. Uh, people come in for permits, um, public record requests, 
um, stuff like that. Uh, we get an average of anywhere from probably 15 to 20 visits per day on a normal day. The offices are pretty much haven't been touched in the last 20 to 25 years. Um, the workstations for the employees are based on a communal workstation. So the employees are basically working right next to each other. Um, what the rehab would do is give individual workstations, uh, individual work cubicles. So related to the COVID, that's pertinent there. It would also um, make the space more efficient for how we interface with the public. Because we have public come in now, we really don't have any public spaces where they can come in and review plans, where they can sit down and fill out forms. We're just doing it on like an ad hoc type basis. This would give the employees separate workstations and also give the public dedicated spaces where they can come in and it just would present a more professionalized appearance for our public facing office here at Fire Headquarters. Okay, Th thank you very much for the explanation. Obviously, we want all of our safety uh, force divisions to, to be brought up to speed and, and really target the, the, where there's, there's the area of most need. So I appreciate the explanation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, anything else, uh, Councilman? No. Okay, all right, uh, I'll go to uh, Councilman Casey, you had the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman to the Chief, just to kind of touch a little bit more on Councilman Polensic's line of questioning, the locution station alerting system, th does that have anything to do with the 911 system or is that an internal paging system that um, has one main headquarter and reaches each each our fire station? To the council chair and the councilman, I will defer to Chief Luke. He's done a lot of research on this actual uh, system. And then if need be, then I'll reach out to Chief Lightcap. Chief Luke, please. Um, once again, um, good afternoon. Um, the, the locution system is related to the 911 call system. Uh, currently, when a call for service comes into fire dispatch, um, it depends on if we're dispatching a single unit or multiple units. We're dispatching the single units. The way they contact the units at the stations could be by phone. Also, it could be we have a PA system in each station. It's set up just like your normal PA system in any building with the speaker, but they have the remote ability at fire dispatch to open that PA, make the announcement, and then close the PA. They get the information. The problem comes in when we need to, say, for a working fire, we have to dispatch multiple units. The PA system wasn't originally built to dispatch multiple units. Over the years, it's been ad hoc on to do that. Uh, currently, the PA system is approximately 30 years old. Uh, the Office of Radio Communications has tried to do updates to it as much as they can, but it's a legacy analog-based system. This locution system, what it does, it brings us fully digital and it integrates the announcing of the runs into the CAD system, so it automates all of that process. When the dispatcher enters the call into the CAD, the computer automatically takes over. It will announce the call at the station or on the apparatus if they're in the field. It's a computer generated voice. It sounds like a natural computer generated voice, not like these digitized voices that you usually see, but it also has the benefit. Um, it provides some physiological benefits when you're trying to wake, you know, alert somebody in the middle of the night um, it's been found to jar somebody with turning lights on suddenly and loud alarms going off. It's phys it has a detrimental physiological impact on the employee. This system scales that alert up over a period, I think it's three to seven seconds. It has ability to control lights, to control apparatus doors. It zones off the fire station so we don't have to alert the whole station. Um, in this package, we have, we foresaw that we would implement this with our EMS units stationed at our station also. So if EMS got a run, it would just alert in the EMS offices. If fire got a run, it would just alert in the fire offices. So it's more like a computerized alerting system that has all the benefits of modern equipment. Okay. Council, and Council, Chief Cavillo, and in addition to that, uh, we're, we're, doing, we're doing well right now as far as our response time with you know calls, call center taking and then also the actual reflex time to get to these calls. This will improve that even more so that we continue to keep that ISO one rating. 
which is a benefit to the city, uh, the city of Cleveland. Okay, and this, Mr. Chairman, to the chief or or the deputy chief, um, this goes to every station that we have, correct? This will go to all 26 locations that we currently have. Okay, and then Mr. Chairman to the chief, the apparatus exhaust system replacement at all fire stations, can you explain what the apparatus exhaust system is? Absolutely, to the chair, to the councilman, I'll have Chief Wayne Nada, my chief of operations, uh, explain that uh, exhaust system uh, capability and what our vision is for the division of fire. Chief Nada, please. Well, it's good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so we all our apparatus that have an exhaust system hooked up to it. So when we start the, the vehicles inside the station, those uh, the diesel exhaust fumes and toxins are captured uh, in that exhaust system that vents, to, vents it to the outside of the building. Uh, prior to having the exhaust systems, which are now about 20 years of age, um, all those fumes, diesel fumes would just accumulate in the station. You know, they would blacken the walls and, and, and ceilings and things of that nature. And every year we'd have to wash, wash them down. So this is just uh, uh, to continue to capture uh, uh, th th those exhaust fumes um, with, a, with a modern system, um, keep, keep the members health, healthy and safe. Uh, it, it's just, uh, I mean, there's really nothing more to that other than just to keep everyone healthy and safe, keep the stations clean for just both the members and the public. So council, okay. also too, I really want to stress the point that uh, once again, we're, we're, we're a community where, where people come and visit and actually uh, seek our services. And so we want to make sure that when, when the citizens come to our fire stations that the ventilation system is proper so that there's no exposure to not only our firefighters, but our citizens of the city of Cleveland and visitors. <clears throat> All right, no, it makes per perfect sense. I just didn't know what the apparatus exhaust system uh, was and then um, Mr. Chairman to the chief I'm, I'm quite surprised that the only um, money that's been allocated for rehab of any of the stations is was the uh, the the headquarters office um, Mr. Chairman if it's to the safety director if it's possible while we're moving through this process if uh, maybe even from capital projects, we can get an update on the conditions of each fire station um, just to make sure that we're not overseeing uh, anything that may need to be done when we have the opportunity to have this, these additional dollars to uh, upgrade any of the, the houses itself. And then my last question, um, Mr. Chairman to the chief was that um, in coming up with your, your, your wish list here um, for the needs for this ARPA dollars, did you happen to survey uh, any of the frontline workers as to what could be possibly needed uh, at each of the firehouses to either make them safer or more comfortable for these guys who are now living in and gals who are now living in, in the COVID era? Uh, I just want to make sure, and, and this probably should go out to the safety director as well for EMS and police, that we're not we're not losing something by, by not having a conversation with any of our fr frontline workers. Um, that we're just not overseeing something that they may see because they're doing the job on a daily basis. So I was just wondering if, you know, if any of the chiefs or the commissioners had actually reached out to any frontline workers to get their ideas or, or their requests of how they thought any of the dollars should be spent. To the chair and the councilman, that's a great question. And uh, we're very fortunate because in the division of fire, we're, we're family. We live there. We have lunch. We have dinner. Director Howard has come out several times to our fire station to have some great, great cuisine as far as what we provide and also life safety and protection. But getting back to your question, uh, all those members within the Division of Fire filter up all that information to my talented team in front of you today. So any of those questions or concerns were vetted through my team. Uh, once again, we looked at this carefully within the parameters of what was expected. And that's what you see today uh, in regards to this meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Casey. Councilman Charles Slipe, you have the floor. Thank you. And, and, and briefly, um, you know, I get this may fall under more of a comment than a question, but, you know, uh, to Councilman Casey's question uh, about um, the, the levels back up. I, I, when this legislation was introduced, 
you know, I had some real um, reluctance about it simply because it's so broad. It's this omnibus bill. And one of my fears is that the, our need as a council to deliberate on the totality of it will slow up things that are urgent and things that could be uh, addressed more quickly in one-off legislation on any number of the items provided in this document uh, or other needs that the council identifies. And, and I wanna just bring that up to my colleagues as something that we need to be thinking through. And an example that I would give, um, you know, in the, the locution station alerting system, the last time I was in uh, engine 43 on Rocky River Drive, which was a couple weeks ago, uh, their existing PA system was actually down. And the only way that dispatch was able to get the call over to the station was to actually call on the phone. Uh, so, you know, there's, I, I'm not sure if that's been repaired at this time, uh, but uh, it, it brings up that there is a broader need to, to make repairs to our, uh, to, to that system and, and other urgent needs that we should be addressing. And I, I think as we go through this process, Mr. Chair, it'll be important for us to get a, a sense of urgency as it relates to each of the items requested, uh, so that if we do feel a need to slow down on some, we're making sure that we're not slowing down on, on, on needs that need some immediate attention. So. Mr. Chair, to the councilman's life, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, Chief. Um, great question. Yeah, so uh, once again, we got a great team here in front of you. And uh, if there's any issues and concerns as far as dispatching and and uh, getting that call to that station, it has been uh, taken care of. And uh, station 43 actually was, uh, we had that discussion with the uh, uh, union and making sure that we uh, provided that uh, uh, repairs in, in regards to what needs to be done. But uh, just to give you a better understanding as far as the capabilities of how we get contacted more than just the phone call. Chief Lightcap, can you touch a little bit as far as, um, how that works, uh, red phone, uh, vocal arm, MDT, so that everybody in this room understands in regards to how that system works. Yes, sir, sure. Uh, so uh, right now, the way that we have to do it is when we, when our dispatch center gets a call in um, to notify the companies, they have to usually leave their, their workstation, get up, move to another workstation, activate the vocal alarm system and then manually put in uh, the units that need to be notified. Um, if they're not using the vocal alarm system, uh, like the councilman said, they'll have to use a phone, they'll pick up that phone and make a phone call. So both of those systems uh, are not ideal. Um, the locution system makes that a digital system where the member doesn't have to get up, they don't have to make a phone call. Um, they hit a button or two and that information is automatically relayed. Um, we did do a, a study um, to identify how much time that would save us in our responses. And going over multiple days, weekends, evenings, daytime, we came up with uh, an average of 28 seconds per call um, that, is, that the system will uh, reduce our uh, call processing time. Thank you, Chief Whitecap. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you. and that's, that I, I personally believe that that's an important investment and I certainly wouldn't want it to be uh, you know, held up uh, any longer than necessary. So uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Chairman Griffin. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Councilman Slife. Um, now we have uh, EMS. Good afternoon. And just to keep in mind, we can get through these couple of sections and then we'll be uh, at the end, everybody. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, safety chair. The first couple of items on the list pertain to medical equipment and the medical equipment that we will be replacing will be our medical cots and our cardiac monitors. The medical cots, this would replace 31 medical cots, and those are used obviously to transport and transfer the sick and injured persons from their home. And then as well, they go in the back of the ambulance and um, getting them out of the ambulance and into the emergency departments. So this would replace the majority of the frontline and spare cots that we have and make them compliant with the triple K specs. 
and also the, uh, the new power load systems that we have. The next item are the cardiac monitors, and this would replace 40, 45 cardiac monitors. The cardiac monitors are used by the division of EMS as well as the five CDF ALS pumpers that they have in service. The cardiac monitors are used as not just a diagnostic tool for critical medical and trauma patients, but also as a treatment for certain cardiac arrhythmias. When you deal with medical equipment, we have to replace it to get the upgrades and also the most um, up-to-date medical options that are available for us. So this would replace all of the cardiac monitors that we have um, for frontline use, as well as our spares when we have to have items serviced or repaired. The next item on the list is ambulances. And we've requested and been approved for 15 ambulances to be replaced out of the current 38 fleet ambulances in the fleet. As everybody's aware, the ambulances for the paramedics, it's their office. So they are tending to the patients in their office. They are responding to medical emergencies and transporting patients to the emergency departments. This would improve the conditions, not just for the paramedics who use the ambulance as their office, but also improves the condition and comfort for the patients who we serve in the community. This would replace most of the vehicles that are greater than 10 years old. And we're looking at anything, most of them over 300,000 miles. This would also include adding the power load system to all the ambulances, this, this number 15. And the power load system assists the paramedics and reduces injuries as they are taking the person out of the ambulance as well as loading them into the ambulance. When we look at recruitment and the staffing for the division of EMS, having up-to-date equipment and a newer fleet also will assist the recruitment team and having individuals come work for the division of EMS for the city of Cleveland. The other item on the list are SUVs, and this would replace all of the SUVs for the supervisors who respond to scenes to assist with the paramedics on the scene of medical emergencies and to provide operational oversight. This would replace the entire frontline fleet and spares for the captains of field operations. All right, so thank you so much. Uh... Thank you so much. I know that out of all the departments, and I know that all the public safety forces have really struggled, but EMS uh, has really struggled. I mean, really, really. And uh, Commissioner, I'd just like to thank you and your team for really um, being on the front line through COVID-19. I don't think that EMS has got nearly enough credit. However, I do know that there's been a lot of things um, that have that have um, challenged or questioned your response times or our ability to respond to certain things. How would these investments help us solidify and reassure our public um, that we're going to continue our response times and do the things that you guys are doing um, because you guys provide such a valuable service. Obviously, having new vehicles in our fleet where this would replace um, the 15 out of the 25 frontline ambulances, it would give us a frontline fleet of 2018 and newer for you know the offices that the paramedics have. And obviously having up-to-date equipment, which when it comes to medical equipment, having up-to-date cardiac monitors and um, the cots that they utilize to transfer patients is essential. It's also a point of when it comes to our recruitment team working diligently, and I need everybody to understand, we've been working hard over the last two years going through COVID. We've held classes that weren't as big as we wanted them to. And I think we discussed this at several of the committee meetings. Um, we have a class of currently 36 EMTs and paramedics in session that will graduate early next year to, to augment the current staff that we have. And then right on the heels of that, we're gonna do another class uh, in March. And then we have two more set for the rest of uh, 2022. We continue to work hard on recruiting, but the issue is not just in the city of Cleveland, it's not just Cuyahoga County, it's not just Ohio. It's across the US that there is a shortage of, of paramedics and the skilled labor that they provide. Um, what's happening is not only paramedics good for and used pre-hospitally, but shortages in the hospitals where they've now resorted to, to using paramedics 
in the emergency departments and a lot of the intensive care units because of the skill level and the ability to treat patients that paramedics have. We have a unique skill, the way we can treat patients in hospital and out of hospital. And you know the trade that we have and what we do is, is highly sought after. Um, paying anywhere from $40 an hour for paramedics up to $75 an hour for critical care paramedics. We are competing against the US and everybody searching for paramedics to rural areas where they have volunteers to obviously urban areas where the need is the most. Um, and we continue to work on our recruitment efforts. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, one more thing before I turn it over to Councilman Valencia. Cots. Um, I see that you have a lot of cots, but what about those automatic lifts? I, I forget, are they called Lucas or something like that? Or I mean, those are the heart pumping machines. Do you, or did you look at some of those or do you already have enough of those that you purchased in uh, the general fund that you actually got passed a couple of uh, months ago? Uh, the auto, the auto pulses we purchased um, utilizing certain uh, monies that we got from EMS billing. So that was used under some other COVID related grants. We are purchasing additional to have the full fleet um, have those devices on them. So that's coming from a different uh, fund source. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And once again, I really want to give kudos to you and uh, your entire EMS team. Um, you know, I know people often talk about fire and police and, and all of those folks, but the EMS uh, group has been just, just heroes and caregivers uh, throughout this whole COVID-19 process. And uh, we can't thank you and all of your team from EMS enough. Thank you so much on behalf of myself and all the council. Okay, Councilman Mike Palenci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my honorable colleagues, and to the, again, to the uh, director and now to the commissioner. Uh, specifically on the on the ambulances, um, those are, I'm assuming, are the heavy duty units, and those are diesel equipped. To the council chair, to the councilman, yes, they are diesel, and they have the DEF, um, which is the low emissions. And I'm not a mechanic, so I can't explain all of that. But they are diesel engines, which I think. Um, are you're, you definitely are aware that we converted to the heavy duty because the wear and tear on the vehicles at the right. engines is much longer than the the light the medium duty trucks that we used to have. Right, and it was that was as you're aware, that was a recommendation of the city council many many years ago that we move from the lighter vehicles to the heavy um, duty vehicles with equipped with diesel engines when we did our white paper report um, sometime a very long time ago. The SUVs, the five SUVs that you are requiring. Um, why would there be a, uh, the, the, the SUVs would be basically the same type of SUVs we'd be using in, um, in police. <clears throat> and yet there is a price differential in police. It's 58,000 and here it's 65,000. Why, why such a difference? There's some, um, to the chairman, to the councilman, there are some components that we have for the computer systems that they have. We also have different um, aspects of it to the back where they keep the equipment to make sure it's secured in the event that there is an accident that the equipment doesn't uh, fall forward and come into them. So it's, it's different um, inside components that we have based on what police would have. Okay. Um, and then finally, um, based just on your previous comments, um, I am greatly concerned, um, not only about the staffing levels in EMS, but also the response time. We've seen cases just recently where people are alleging that due to the, the lack of response or the poor response, individuals have, have perished. They've lost their lives. We've seen those family members on TV. We've seen We've heard the stories. We've seen, again, how long it has taken to get to some of these homes um, and, these, and these individuals. So what, what, I, what I'd really like to know out of the administration um, and to the, to the safety director, um, back, just as backfilling police positions are critical, we've got to do everything we can to fill open via uh, EMS positions. I mean, it's critical. It's life and death. You know, it's, it, there's no other way about it to describe it. It's life and death. So are we thinking, are we trying to think outside of the box? What are we going to do to tr try to attract EMS 
personnel to our division? I mean, because we, we can't continue to operate like this with having these kind of delays, this kind of problems. And then again, it puts a bigger burden on fire as a first responder who then again can't transport. Uh, they can only try to make that, that patient as comfortable as they can, but they're not going to throw them up on a ladder truck to take them to a hospital. So I'm, I'm trying to understand these not only now, but going into the new administration, whoever it's going to be, backfilling critical positions um, in the division, in public safety, specifically our three frontline divisions, police, fire, AMS, have got to be the most critical issue going into the end of this year and next year. There's, I don't think, I can't think of anything that's even close to it because I hear this all the time. I hear it, I see it, I experience it. And, um, so tell, is there any, is there any light at the end of the tunnel at this point that we can hope to see these positions filled? Councilman, uh, so I got the echo. Councilman, uh, through chair, we have been, uh, you know, dealing with staffing issues, uh, not unique to any other, um, you know, emergency service provider in the country. We have, we have been dealing with those. We've been very candid about that. We have classes in, um, it does take time to graduate the classes. Um, you know, we, we, we did a presentation on it about the, um, the classes that we have, the scheduling of the class that we have in, the class that we graduate. And then we hear from council about a month later as inquiring about staffing again. And it's, it, it does, it takes time for a class to get in. I'll let Commissioner Carlton speak to the time that it takes to, uh, to once a class gets started, how much, time it takes to, how much time it takes for them to graduate and to get on the street. But some of the out of box things that we have considered, so I wanted to address that specifically is that we have a job posting for part-time paramedics that we had to engage in discussion with the unions on um, to try to have their support. And that took, that took some time. Another thing that we have as far as the out of the box is that South High School is, is critical for us so that we can have a larger space um, to have larger class sizes. Um, for on, a, on a separate um, safety committee meeting, I talked about how we had about 100 uh, EMTs that we were trying to find space for. And the current space that we had at the, at the fire training academy and at the police, I'm sorry, at the fire training academy and the EMS um, training facility that we didn't have space for, we had to do those over at, the, at Huntington. If we can have a, a, a larger facility to facilitate larger class sizes, I can't tell you how, how helpful that would be. There is the, also with recruitment. Recruitment is, 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 is proving to be challenging um, just because of how the public views public safety as a whole. Um, trying to find folks who are interested in the EMTs and understand what being an EMT means. I mean, we have folks who come on and once they realize what being an EMT means, they, can't, they realize they can't handle it, so they, they leave. I mean, you have folks who are dealing with um, blood, trauma, emergency situations that it takes someone to have a, ment a, a certain type of mental fortitude to deal with. Um, so we're looking at even doing uh, uh, psych, psych assessments for, when we, for, hiring, for hiring for that to make sure that we're getting the right people. So this, this, is, this, it's, this is not a, a single solution uh, problem. Um, it stems from recruitment, getting, get, getting uh, uh, our hiring and recruitment in line, having the space to facilitate the larger classes, making sure that we are hiring the right people and um, trying to condense the training in a way that doesn't sacrifice the quality of the individual that we're putting on the truck, but make sure that they are getting everything that they need and understand what being an EMT in the city of Cleveland is. Because it's different to be an EMT in Cleveland than to be an EMT in like in, 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 a, in a smaller municipality uh, like Shaker. So it's, 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 it's different. Um, but that, that is always on our, on our minds. And, um, you know, again, I, got, I, I have to go back and I keep harping on is that the, the value of getting a larger space um, is important. Now, there are some other things that um, are worthy of discussion. Um, and and you know, there'll be a time for that, I'm sure, which is salaries and, and, and making it easier to cross over from EMT to paramedics. One of the things that uh, Councilman um, uh, uh, Griffin and I had discussed was how um, Columbus partners with their um, Columbus State University with, a lot, with, with, with exchanging ride time and class time to make it an easier and no cost for the, um, 
the, 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 the personnel to go from EMT to paramedic. That is also something that we have to discuss. So when, when folks come on to be an EMT, we want them to stay. We want them to, uh, to cross over and to become paramedics um, in the city. And another thing that we, that we have looked at is that folks who were coming on for training, uh, addressing attrition, um, coming on, getting the training that Cleveland provides and leaving. Um, so we did install a reimbursement agreement um, to, um, you know, that if the folks who come on and they, they want to be, their intent is to work in the city of Cleveland, that reimbursement agreement is not a barrier to them. But we, we have had is, we have had heard some concern about that agreement from folks who um, I think that their motives is questionable. I mean, what, whether they come on to get the training from the city of Cleveland and leave, that's not what we want. We want someone who, who wants to work, you know, in the city of Cleveland. So that's another thing that, that we did was out of the box. So um, with that, if there's always any other suggestions, we are always willing to, willing to have that discussion. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Carlton, who can, who can talk about the, the time frame from class to graduation to getting onto the street for our EMT and paramedics. Thank you, Director, to the Chairman, uh, through the Chairman to the Councilman. Um, we definitely thought outside the box on some ideas, and, and um, the box hasn't stopped. We're, we're still continually thinking about our staffing. It's been challenging and, you know, everybody talks about the hospitals being challenged and they're closing certain hospitals down, not doing surgeries, but, you know, everybody forgets about the pre-hospital side because that's where a lot of things start for emergent situations. And as you know, EMS has provided a service to the community that is different than most communities and the level of care that we provide um, to the citizens. We do continue to prioritize our calls to make sure that we are getting to those with the most emergent medical and traumatic injuries that we can. And um, individuals that have injuries or medical emergencies where it's not life threatening that they are prioritized and, and we dispatch in response to those in the most critical need um, initially. And I understand, you know, we're using the fire first responders, but they can provide, you know, the, the basic level of care and the ALS pumpers are able to provide an advanced level of care to the citizens prior to EMS arriving. We continue, like I said, to work hard on the recruitment side. Uh, we have the EMT training program. It takes two months to train people approximately to become EMTs. They have to take their registry testing, but paramedicine is, is a long um, um, class time. We're looking at it, it's, it's over a year for most individuals to obtain their paramedic certification. So, it's nothing lightly. Um, the level of care that we provide and the knowledge that the paramedic has is extensive. Uh, we can do as much as, as nurses can do, but our schooling is condensed in a much shorter period of time than, than registered nurses. Um, we do work hard on that, and we have a big group of EMTs coming through. You know, it's over, we have 29 individuals or 28 who are EMTs out of this class of 36. So it's a big, heavy group of EMTs, and we have to help them make it through the whole paramedic portion, which is a whole nother year. Well, I, again, and I, and I appreciate your response, but, and I support obviously the equipment upgrades. I've advocated that for a long time about bringing on new EMS vehicles. Um, so we can, we can keep our, our fleet in, in proper condition, but if we don't have the personnel to operate the fleet, the main to maintain it, um, then it's a whole nother ball game. So again, I, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to leave it at this point. You know, we, maybe we need to, reach out to Cleveland Clinic, to UH, to Metro, if we need help in training, if we need assistance. It would, the report just came out in Cleveland Clinic of all the major medical institutions. They have the poor give back to the community. So maybe it's time to ask them to step up to the plate to help us uh, as it pertains to whether it be division of EMS or wherever the case may be. I mean, in 2021, we have to do things differently. We have to look upon things differently. And I'm, I'm just saying, as we go into the end of this year in 2022, um, we have to make sure we're ramped up. We fought hard. Uh, some Nobody's here that was that was around when I was here. We fought hard to, to build e an EMS system rather than throwing people in the back of police cars. We built, a, we worked hard to build an EMS system. And, I'm, and I'm, I wanna say to my colleague, the council, this city council, Took the, took the lead in making sure that that happened. So I, just as it, it, we took the lead many, many years ago, I, I want us to continue to take the lead to make sure that we have the best EMS system that we can possibly have. So if it means increasing the, the pay bands, if it means uh, working with other institutions, 
then, then we got to do it. You call when a citizen calls for EMS, they want someone at their home, not in 20 minutes or 25 minutes or whenever the case may be, or worrying about whether their loved one is going to make it. We've got to make sure that we have a system in place that services our citizens. That's what I'm committed to. I'm here to work with the administration, you commissioner, you safety director, Mr. Safety Director, and my colleagues. But to see some of the things that we've seen just recently about people, again, alleging because of poor EMS response, their loved ones have, have passed on, lost their lives, is not a very sobering message that, that we're getting in this city. And, and we've got to get beyond that. we got to fix it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And, thank you and so Councilman much. Through the chair, I just want to make sure that, um, that it be known that, you know, that our, um, between EMS and fire responding, um, <laughs> we've suffered no loss of life due to a lack, due to a lack of response. I have had questions from council about response times that have been alleged and I have verified and, and spoken to our communication center and Commissioner Carlton and, 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 and sent over the actual response times um, for, for that. And, and it's different than what the community has. Now, you know, when you're in an emergency situation, time seems like it's, just, it's, it's, it's right. going for a really long time. But when those calls come in, um, the, 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 from, from call time to deployment to arrival, it is not it is not the same as the citizen has been relaying to the members of council who, I, who I've interacted with. But I just want to make sure that that's that's uh, that's clear. But we do, and, and that's not to say we don't share your concern. We absolutely do share your concern, and um, and and we want to get we need to get bodies in these classrooms, uh, and we need to hire. So. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm holding on fast to a quorum. I'm holding on with for dear life. So we got two more small pieces, and I know that IT is going to be uh, pretty uh, intensive. But uh, animal control, did you want to briefly go through that? My only question is going to be groundhogs. But go ahead, Director. Thank you, Chair. So for animal care and control, um, and I'm not sure if he's been on here before, but we have a um, animal air control manager, Corey Keller. Um, he's asked for uh, some vehicles for EMS. Um, uh, personnel is not on here because again, personnel does not fall within the opera qualifications, but the amount here is for three animal care control, three animal control vehicles to the tune of $70,000 each, $210,000. Uh, Corey, can you please um, share about how these vehicles will affect the operations of animal care and control? Yes, thank you, Director. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Council. Thank you for having me. This is my first Council meeting. Um, so our request is simple. Um, it's to add a three additional animal control vehicles to our fleet. Um, they're extremely vital and important to what we do in the city. Um, we currently have three vehicles that are pretty much outdated um, and we need to expand our fleet so that we can provide more coverage for the city. Um, as of right now, we do have two vans that are basically non-functional and non-safe for our animal control officers. Um, one has to be jump-started. The other one, the doors don't completely shut all the way. Um, and then we also have a truck that's not really adequate for transporting animals. So that's why we're requesting three brand new uh, animal control units. Um, more specifically, we're looking at customizing um, newer vans to accommodate our needs. All right. So it's pretty much straightforward. You just need more vehicles to make more runs. And I know that I've had the unfortunate um, task of having an injured dog that got hit by a car in front of the house and your group came out immediately. Um, and it was, I found, I think it might've been a volunteer, but um, you know, I always wonder what happened to that, uh, that uh, animal, but I do know and see the need for those extra vehicles. So with that being said, um, Councilman Mike Polinsic, and then uh, we'll move on. Councilman Polinsic. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wholeheartedly support the addition of new vehicles. My only question is, is John Baird still with the, with the, with the division? Yes, sir. He's actually in uh, court today, but he okay. is, yes. I, I just want to make sure. I've, obviously, I, I support this. We've got to make sure we have our, our the best equipment possible for our people who are working the streets. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I won't belabor it in this one because I want to move through the agenda, Mr. Chair, but I do want to let you know that um, it is very critical that we have a conversation about trapping, 
and um, trapping these uh, rodents like groundhogs and raccoons and other things. Um, Director, I know you've already probably submitted your budget, but I will tell you this council, at least me and um, a couple of others that I know are really going to try to go hard about animal control. We got to do a better job. Um, we're getting we're getting hammered. We got little old ladies that are being held hostage by these groundhogs that are just ravaging our community. So I know it seems like a joking matter or it seems kind of funny, but it is something that I really hope to work with you, Mr. Keller and Mr. Baird to address. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move to IT. And I do know that um, I want to just make sure we also send condolences to Larry Jones II. I know he's lost his father and he's usually the one that handles IT. Uh, but um, director, I know you um, are going to present on his behalf, and uh, are we send our thoughts and prayers to um, Larry Jones the second on the passing of his father, Judge Larry Jones. So, director, please proceed. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, so, we've identified um, 127 locations where we would place cameras uh, at. That's uh, approximately 17 cluster, um, 17 clusters where these where these cameras would be. The total count of the cameras would be 429 cameras, which which will provide the following views: um, multi-sensor cameras, which will provide views of north, south, east, and west. Fixed artificial intelligence cameras that would focus on wrong way drivers entering exit ramps and license plates. Uh, pan, tilt, and zoom cameras which would allow the operators to move the cameras around in real time to capture um, activity as is happening. And these cameras will provide the operators with an additional 858 camera views. The total cost for, for, for this product would be 4,485,000. I wanna make sure, let me see. Uh, $4,485,400. So that would bring us to a total, you know, to a total of, um, uh, this is an initial 143. The, ca the camera product would be 429 with um, with stream with video streams of a number 158. I do have Sergeant Garcia from the Real Time Crime Center on to um, to speak to this um, to, and to provide some additional detail. Sergeant Garcia. Sarge, you still there? I see your name. I don't see his name. Oh, I see his name. Yeah, his name is still on here. I don't see his name on here. I tell you what, Director, let's go ahead and start with the line of questioning. And sure. if um, somebody can get a message to Sergeant Garcia, he can join us as we move on. All right. Um, just briefly, uh, Director, I want to, uh, I know that, I know that Councilman Polinsic is, is, uh, uh, so he, he can't wait to jump in, but I'm going to just say a couple of things that I want to just ask. Is this second phase going to include parks? And will they include the infrastructure on the light poles that we um, originally wanted to utilize some of the LED lighting for? Um, can you let us know if any of this technology will be to upgrade those areas? Because I know that the problem has been that it had to be a city facility to put it in the vicinity of a city facility. But with these new clusters, and, and I hear you said 127 extra cameras with 17 different clusters, and they're different types of cameras, will they be cameras that will be able to be in the light poles? as well as commercial districts, as well as parks? Um, so Chair, just before I begin, so Sergeant Garcia sent me a text. He said he needed permission to-, to uh... Oh. Could one of our team, or if he could try to do it again, because usually I could let him in, but I don't see it. Because he would be the best one to answer this question. I will tell you that the, pro that the proposed connectivity for these, would be through a cellular router and, and a uh, recording appliance. Uh, Sergeant Garcia would be uh, best equipped to go into uh, that, that additional detail. The one of our council team put Sergeant Mr. Garcia. Mr. Chairman, he's not in the waiting room. He's not in the he's waiting not. room. not, no. So he, it looks like he's joined us. He just needs to unmute himself and get on the camera. I tell you what, Director, why don't you have him go out and try to come back in? Sure. Give me one moment. Okay. 
This is the last section I promised to my colleagues and then we'll move it to the next phase. I just wanna keep us on the timeline that we've given ourselves to try to make sure that we do our due diligence and process by November the 1st. So this is a critical step. So then we can move it to the working group and to finance so that we can move this process down the line. Remember, um, I know I have uh, Ms. Gray as well as Councilwoman Santana. You have to be on camera for your vote to be counted, okay? Is Chair, Sergeant Garcia is here he now. We're letting him in now. Okay, good to go. Here he is now. Do I need to reiterate my question for him? Could you please? Sure. We'll give him a chance to get a breather first. I'll be the warm up act for Mike Palencia because I know Mike is ready to go. He's been waiting for this one for a while. Sorry, Chair, while we wait, can I can I tell you something? Can I say something real quick? I know that you you had because you had asked about the drones. Um, yeah, before, right. but not seeing the drones. Um, and I just want to state specifically why that's not there because that is a program that's in, the, in its infancy. We're doing fact finding with that. We just took a trip out to Chula Vista to view their drone program. At this point for this year, it would be, it would be a little bit premature to put it on there. Um, the next administration will have its, its portion of these funds to, to allocate. Um, but we have to get the, um, you know, the, the divisional notices, the general police orders, bring it for council for legislation. So there's a lot that has to go with drones. So I just want to say that that's why that piece is not he here under IT or, or or in police. Okay. And director, I know that um you know a lot is going to fall on the next administration, but I do want to make sure that we tee it up that this council is very interested in innovation and really interested in. I don't want to name brands, but gun sensor technology, drones and um, trying to make sure that we have technology to better deal with car chases to make sure we have more responsible car chases Absolutely. are all important things for me as a chair and us as a council. So Absolutely. please just put a pin in that with your team and your staff that that is something that this council is very, um, very, very um, intent on trying to make happen, okay? Yeah, and we, we look forward to bringing that for public conversation as well because it's, there's, there's a lot of public concern about it as well. Sergeant Garcia is, is, is ready and, and unmuted. Okay. Sergeant Garcia, can you come on the screen? So, Sergeant Garcia, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, the question hey, that I have uh, the, to, uh, to ask is, uh, with these new cameras, I believe you said 127 cameras that are going to 17 different zones, Will they be going, is this next phase going to, one, follow the recommendations that our council and commanders have given to the, uh, to the team, to the staff? Number two, are they going to be in parks? Then are they going to be in light poles? Because I know that we have LED lighting, and it was told to us that this technology can possibly be embedded in those light poles. So we're just trying to see the next generation of cameras and uh, Director Howard gave us some intel on how they operate, but if you can elaborate on those questions, sir. Sure, 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 Cousin. Uh, uh, basically, the, currently we're using uh, our heat maps and GIS maps to uh, determine uh, the, the worst spots that are currently uncovered by the, the 1600 cameras that we currently have now. And we're using also uh, trying to overlay the uh, request from council and to determine what's left over as far as where we're putting the cameras at. Okay. Uh, as, as far as uh, which polls, I think that's de determined by location. Uh, not every location has uh, one of the LED polls, but when we can, we do use all of uh, uh, Cleveland Public Power uh, polls when available. Okay. All right, because I mean, I know that, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to really be sold on, and we had a lot of the conversations about mounting some of those in hotspot areas on commercial districts and business districts, and uh, really being able to embed them in poles and other city infrastructure besides just rec centers and city buildings. So yeah. um, hopefully this next evolution of cameras that we'll have that opportunity. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go to Mike Polinsic. Uh, and he'll he's probably has a follow up line of questioning to uh, all of this, but for time's sake, I'll just pivot to him so that he can go next. Councilman Pulisic. Uh, thank thank you, Mr. Chairman, and for your line of questioning, and and to my honorable colleagues, and to the command staff, and to the director. I got to tell you, the, the whole issue of security cameras has got to be one of the most frustrating things I've dealt with over the years. 
you know, we council has repeatedly requested and advocated for security cameras in our neighborhood because we can see the 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 benefit of having them. The the various crimes and criminal activity that has taken place had cameras been in those locations, many locations, we would have had a much better opportunity to identify the perpetrators and to bring them to justice or just from a standpoint of decreasing criminal activity in the community. We were told with the 1,100 cameras that were going to go up, the first phase was 1,100. Now we're hearing it's 1,600. Um, Chairman touched on it. We were all asked to put together a list with our commanders, all members of city council, and myself, Councilman Harrison, and, um, and Commander Sammy Morrison of fifth, we worked diligently to put together the list for each of our wards. Out of the list that I established and we identified, it was either 52 or 53 camera locations, potential locations. I think 95% of those cameras never went up. And then we were told, Mr. Chairman, to the safety director and to um, Officer Garcia um, that, well, we lack the city lacked the infrastructure, lacked the cell towers or whatever the heck they used to, to transmit the data. Um, so it's been year after year, we've been going around on these cameras, our citizens and the administration's own uh, survey that, we, that was submitted to us by the chief of staff, acting chief of staff, Sharon Dumas. The number one category as well known as public safety, but embedded in public safety was the implementation of safety and security cameras. This is a major issue with our citizens, major issue. They want these cameras up, especially in the commercial districts of our neighborhoods. So now we're hearing there's gonna be 127 locations, 429 cameras and six, something cameras, six what uh, alternative, or I don't know what, what these things are, um, for a total cost of $4.4 .4 million. Mr. Chairman, I wanna know where they're going. I wanna list by ward as to where this these cameras are being recommended to go. Because I'm not going through this anymore. This is an issue that the council has led on we demanded safety and security cameras, and we haven't gotten what we were promised. And our citizens know it, and I hear it constantly. I hear it constantly in our business districts, in my own business districts. Why can't we have cameras? Why aren't the cameras up? So I need to understand if there's areas of the city, Mr. Chairman, where because of the infrastructure is not there, the towers or whatever they need, we need, to, we, we need to know before I'm going to vote for another 4.4 million bucks for cameras on top of what we have spent already, th th there's got to be a better rollout here and there's got to be more information presented to city council. Um, no more, you know, bait and switch. No more, we're doing this, we're doing that. No, 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 no. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. I heard it all and I'm not buying it anymore. I want to know where the cameras are going by ward. I want to know where we're lacking infrastructure and what do we have to do to implement that infrastructure. And at the end of the day, um, if we're, we have 1600 cameras in this city, as we just heard, I would venture to say the majority of those are downtown, not in our neighborhood. And Councilman, I got to reiterate if I feel mommy, me, because I'm a little bit frustrated. Yeah. I thought that the council director, I thought that the council person was supposed to have an audience with either you and or the IT people to go over all of these specific details. And the reason I share that is because I know that um, police are police and Homeland Security are Homeland Security. Nobody wants to just broadcast to the whole public to say, hey, here's where everything's at because we know that criminals yeah. won't go there. But the council person has to be able to be well informed while they make these decisions. So my question is, if that hasn't happened for Councilman Polinsic, why hasn't it or how can it? If Councilman Polinsic doesn't mind me doing that. It, it, it didn't happen not only for me, Mr. Chairman, 
but I understand it didn't happen for the majority of members of the body as well. Okay. So at the end of the day, uh-huh. we have to do things differently. We have to know exactly where they're going. We have to, inter- is this going to interface with our existing system? Is the, is the, um, the fusion center, uh, are we going to have someone at the fusion center monitoring cameras? And then the other point, and I'm, I'll leave it at that, then I can get a response. Then I'm hearing that there, ca- that there are cameras up that aren't even working in the city due to lack of maintenance. So again, there's got to be a holistic plan here. And other city, I mean, other cities are doing this. And for some reason, we just can't get our act together here. And I don't understand why. And I'm beyond it. I want results. My citizens want results. I hear it from them. I hear it from my local businesses. And I, I'm I, I, no more smoke and mirrors, no more false promises. I, I want reality. I want reality at this point. And so I'll leave it at that. And I'm looking forward to who can ever present us the information that I requested. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director. If I may, so just a, a couple points. So the, it's, the, it's the real-time crime center that um, that monitors the cameras. The fusion center, is, is, they don't serve that function. Uh, so it's the real-time crime center. The cameras that we that we have up have been instrumental in solving numerous crimes um, that either have captured cameras, uh, crimes as they happen while the, while the real-time crime center is being monitored or have gone, we've gone to the real-time crime center to capture, see, see what they have captured for, uh, with, with regard to crimes and, and uses a crime solving tool. So it's been instrumental for that purpose. Um, we have previously stated that sending a list out to council with all of the locations of the cameras is counterproductive. We, we, we have had conversations with, with council that has, that, and information has been passed out to the press, sending the list out where all the, of where all the cameras are um, poses a significant risk to safety and the effect and compromise the effectiveness of the of the cameras. But what we have said, and we haven't received any 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 email request about it or any request, is that if a council person wants to meet to discuss um, the locations of these cameras, you know, send us let us know so that we can so that we can get it scheduled. That would be you know with um, with our uh, IT personnel, and we haven't gotten any of the, any of the requests. We stand stand by that. Um, but we cannot distribute the document that has all of the locations of all of the cameras around the city because, again, it, it, it would compromise the, the, the effectiveness of it. So if, if, um, um, if, someone Director, wants, if, if the list wants to be viewed, that we, we, we can coordinate that with Larry. Director, can I do this? Because I want to put this to bed because this conversation has come up too much. Can That's you right. send myself and Councilman Polensic? an email with um, Mr. Jones when he comes back or Sergeant Garcia and work with our assistants to schedule this. And I would tell my assistants to work closely with um, Mary Louise so that we can get this on the books. Let's just, let's get it done. Let's not talk about it anymore. I want to team up with Councilman Polensic like today and schedule a time where we can sit down with you as chair and vice chair to go over this in detail, and I would like to be a part of that with him if we could. And Mr. Chairman, I would just add, how many times I hear the members of the body at the table say, ask for a meeting, and the director now is saying that no one has asked for that. I no, mean, that's not, that's not, Councilman, that's not what I'm saying. Please don't, don't, saying? don't mischaracterize what I'm saying. What I'm saying okay. is that, and I, what I have, what we have stated is that if anyone is interested in having one to send us, a, 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 you know, to send us an email so that we can set it up. Um, because there's 17 okay. council, there's 17 members of council, um, and you know if if all okay. council, all all members of council have not an ex, have not expressed a desire to have that meeting. So we have said that if a council person wants to have that meeting, please reach out to us exactly. so that we can work to schedule it. That's so I, I just don't want what I'm well, saying. Well, chair and vice chair, you'll get it. You'll get it, right. you'll get it today. Chair and vice chair, I would like to make sure that I initiate that as me <laughs> being the chair right. and as Councilman Polinsky being you. the vice chair. I would like to initiate that meeting that he and I can have with you to go over the entire process. And then we will reiterate with our colleagues what we need to do. But as him being vice chair Thank and you. me being chair, Councilman Polinsic, does that work for you? That I that, that, that's, that's, that's fine, Mr. Chairman, just so we can get some resolution. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it, Councilman Polinsic. And Director, we'll follow up and you and I will make sure that we connect that and make it happen. And I'm taking on the burden of making it happen just as much. So, you know, I really want to make sure we see it done. Okay. 
All right. Uh, I have uh, Councilman Charles Slife, and then uh, and then uh, we'll conclude. Char Councilman Slife. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll keep this uh, as long and drawn out as possible so we can spend the afternoon together. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Mr. Chair, I guess I, I'm not going to belabor this point and, and we can discuss it on the council side, but I guess I don't really understand the administration's uh, reluctance to share the camera locations. The cameras all have a flashing blue light on top of them. I can tell at least the ones that are public. Maybe there's more. And maybe if the difference is that there's some cameras that are don't have a flashing blue light on top of them, and that's for an intentional reason. Okay, we can discuss that. But I, I can tell you where all the cameras are in Ward 17. I can tell you where they aren't. And if we're able to ask some intrepid citizens to drive around the city and mark down the locations of blue lights that are flashing at night, I don't understand why the administration won't just provide that information more readily. So that 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 that's I, I'm a little confused on that point, but. Um, you know, Mr. Chair, I'm I'm sending over a um, uh, a memo via John James uh, to the administration, and one of the requ well, related to a number of ARPA things, but one of them uh, builds off of what Councilman Polensic said. I've also been told that there's a a, in, uh, a difficulty in expanding cameras in the neighborhood I represent, simply because being on the edge of the city and how the city IT infrastructure exists, it connects city facilities. So if you're in the center of the city, it's it's easier to quickly tap into an existing network. But to put a camera at say you know Warren Road and I-90, you would have to run new infrastructure out because it's 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 essentially expanding the web. Um, so the ask that I have of the administration, in addition to knowing where the cameras are, is to know where that infrastructure is and to see where these gaps are. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up and my question for the administration is um, knowing that broadband is also uh, a, a big component of how we're looking to spend ARPA dollars. What conversations are being had between kind of the, the silo of public safety and the silo of IT to make sure that our broadband plans will kill two birds with one stone and allow residents to have access to internet, but also give us the infrastructure that we need to boost our security cameras and really bring our real-time crime center to the next level. Director. So Councilman, so that conversation would be driven by uh, our IT person who is not available today, but I can get that, I can get an answer for you to that. But with regard to the locations of the cameras that we have, we've, we've had, we've hashed that out um, uh, numerous times with our, with the, with the law department and on, on, on council uh, meetings is that there's a difference between providing the, providing a readily available list that that's, that's accessible and, 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 and can be shared throughout the community. And then, you know, and then criminals or, or, or folks who are engaged in criminal activity going out actively looking for cameras. I don't believe that all of the cameras throughout the city have blue lights. DC Patel, uh, who's our Homeland Security um, person can, can probably answer that. But um, there are cameras out there that are not so readily apparent by a, by a flashing blue light. And it does become a security issue when you have a, a, uh, the, the, the locations of all the cameras being an open public record. The, the, the reason why it's not a public record is because that the law creates a, an exception for it as a, um, as, as a security issue. Um, but again, um, we are already in the process of, of drafting the email um, to the chair and vice chair uh, to set up a, a, that meeting um, so that we can uh, raise their attention to these, look, these cameras. Uh, if I may, sir, uh, through the chair to the, to the committee, just to let you know about the uh, cameras, we do have a request for some additional cameras, which are mobile cameras, uh, two, two different versions. One is mobile, like in a trailer, like the ones you see at, uh, let's say we have the St. Patrick's Day Parade or a football game or something of that sort. We'll have a uh, portable trailer deployed that has direct feedback to the real time crime center or other locations. There are uh, additional uh, cameras that we're buying a very small subset of that are going to be deployed uh, rather covertly throughout the city. And those are more for obviously uh, covert operations. So those we are certainly uh, reticent to, to share those locations. Plus those locations can change day to day because the nature of that platform is that it can be changed uh, fairly quickly by, uh, by one of the investigators just remounted somewhere else. And again, it's a live feed directly back to the real-time crime center or uh, to district command or wherever we want to send that feed. So that is a, a slight nuance that we did not have before. 
uh, but uh, I certainly concur with the director about the uh, historical uh, issue here with, with the camera list, but also to Councilman uh, Blensick's point, uh, that list originally came, it's, it's been a couple of years, uh, and we reconciled that list and we went through great lengths to ensure that the list submitted by the district commanders was one that they had conferred with the um, uh, councilman. So the councilman, the commanders had a, a list and they recommended areas. And then obviously on the IT side, uh, two more components. One was the heat maps. So obviously we're looking at data driven, but the other side is on the IT side, some of those locations were readily available to plug and play pretty much. And some were not, some needed additional infrastructure which caused some additional delay. So every location that we all might have thought would have been an ideal location might have been one that was uh, relegated to phase two or phase three of, of the project because of, of the infrastructure requirements. But uh, uh, thank you for your support in this, thank you. Thank you and, and, and uh, Chairman Griffin, I'll, I'll just close by saying one of my goals with security okay, cameras right. Is to, is She's going to pull it to the back. In addition to going off of the, the hot spots, which we've done, uh, is, is to build off of a lot of what was just said. And, and you know, in uh, last year during budget hearings, while the mayor was before us and we were actually talking about violent crime, there was an attempted carjacking down the street from me. And they were unsuccessful, but within about a minute and a half, they were able to flee and to get on I-90 and they're gone. And, and one of my goals is in addition to hotspot locations, just to do major intersections, key gateways, so that when crime does occur, we're able to track suspects through a neighborhood and hopefully intervene and be able to apprehend in, in that manner, knowing that we can't have our camera uh, at, at every given location. So that's that's one of my goals. But in order to do that, we have to have this uh, 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 larger IT infrastructure uh, to get to every corner of the city. And for those of us that represent areas that are on the edge of the city, uh, just that infrastructure isn't in place today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Slife. I'm going to ask for a very brief moment if Dolores Gray would join us on screen one more second, if she could. If Dolores Gray can join us on screen just very briefly. Is Ms. Gray there? Okay, I'll text Ms. Gray, but um, Kevin Bishop has his hand, but I'm going to text Ms. Gray and reach out to her. Councilman Bishop. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'll be brief. Um, you, you know, I'm I, like Councilman Polensic, I am. I, I have not been happy with our our uh, camera program over here in my area of the uh, of the city. Um, we I have requested uh, multiple times um, um, for some access to uh, footage, and some citizens that have requested access to some footage uh, multiple times, and it's been frustrating, just to say the least. Are we going to revisit how we operate this program and the um, and the public's and the council? Council's uh, access to the to these cameras and their in, in its footage uh, when crimes or things in the community take place, and I'll take my question and I'll I'll listen for my uh, my answer offline. On council side, yes, we are going to revisit. And actually, I know I invited myself and Councilman Polinsic, but I'm going to talk with the safety director. I may just have um. Let, let's let's just I'll work on, with you on that too, Councilman Bishop. But to answer your question, yes, we're going to I'm going to personally make sure we have to walk each individual person into the safety director's office and work with him on understanding how this process works. I will work closely with the safety director on that. He's been very accessible to me, so I will take him up on his offer to do that. OK. But be before I go, before you answer Councilman Bishop's question, I do want to do this because I need a quorum and there's four of us on here now. So I just want to um, vote this out so that we can get it to the next phase, which is the working group, as well as the, uh, as well as, um, you know, hearing it in finance. But um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, Councilwoman Gray is not on the committee. Councilman Casey is a member of the safety committee. Okay, so Councilwoman Gray, and so I have Councilwoman Santana and Councilman Polensic. But can't yeah. uh, can't they be, uh, what is it called? It's uh, when they, uh, in a, in a, what pro is it tem. called? Yeah, pro tem, right? 
Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, can we add her as pro tem on this if we could? Okay. Yes, Mr. Chairman. All right, so uh, adding that as pro tem. So 843-2021, the uh, ARPA has moved out of public safety. We will now follow up to the working group as well as the finance committee um, as we continue to deliberate these conversations. So we will have other bites at this apple. I just wanted to make sure that we at least did our due diligence through a three and a half hour hearing to make sure that we did um, you know, at least vet this through public safety. I wanna follow up with Councilman Bishop. He had a couple of follow-up questions and then I have a couple of other instructions to finalize us with. Councilman Bishop. Councilman yes, Bishop. Chairman, I, yeah, I've, yeah, I've answered the questions. I, I've asked the questions I wanted to answer. Okay. okay. So I will All team right, up right. with you, Councilman Bishop, and um, you and I will work closely with the safety director so that we can have some time with him to go over all of that with you. Okay. All right, thanks. All right. Uh, hearing no more questions, Director, thank you for your patience and your time today. Thank you for my colleagues and all of the uh, team that help us uh, do this meeting today. We know that this was a pretty long meeting, but we had some very critical things we had to discuss. Once again, we will have more bites at the apple with this. Um, Director, I would like if um, we have follow up, there's a couple of things that we might need price points on. Um, I'm really interested in uh, rape kits and what kind of things um, that we could do to deal with domestic violence and rape kits and also with um, crime and forensics that um, may qualify under ARPA dollars. So we may need to have some follow-up conversations with you around making sure that we have some tools and equipment to address some of those things, okay? So you may get some follow-up emails from myself and Ann Tilly on how we can address some of those issues uh, because we do wanna deal with um, civil unrest and other tools that uh, Chief outlined, but we also wanna closely monitor how we can beef up our technology and our tools to deal with some of the pressing issues that COVID is, uh, has uh, caused, like more domestic violence and suicide prevention and other things like that, okay? But thank you for your time and well thought out and, and great job, Director, for really uh, you know going through the line items on this. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Chair. This Committee of Public Health is adjourned and uh, we look forward to talk to you next time. Have a good Chair, day. Chair, just, you, said, you said public health. Just public one safety. Oh, sorry, public safety. <laughs> public safety, all right? Okay, thank well, you. I have one clarification, Chair. Is that you, were saying, you were saying 127 cameras. I just want to correct. The number is 143. 143, okay. Thank you. I want to make sure we get it on public record, 143. All right, thanks, Director.